Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as a supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O oh Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Honorable Senators, I have received requests for leave of absence from today's sitting of the Senate from the following Senators. Senator Anil Roberts, Senator Damian Lida, Senator Paul Richards, Senator Sharice Sipasad, Senator Dr. Maria Dillon Remy. And Honorable Senators, the leave the members seek is granted. Urgent questions. Senator Mark. Thank you, Madam President. To the Minister of Education. In light of the increasing number of COVID-19 positive cases and the request by tutor to postpone the upcoming SEA examination, can the minister indicate the government's position on said request? Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Madam President, I thank my colleague for the question. Madam President, at this time, the government's number one priority is keeping citizens of this country safe. The government has put strict and robust measures in place to reduce the COVID numbers, and the success of these measures over the next few days will greatly impact the decision on what would happen in relation to the SEA, which is scheduled for June 10th. Madam President, the government recognizes that the exam is important, and all possible preparations are being made by the Ministry of Education, and together with the Ministry of Health and all the other ministries involved for the safe implementation of the SEA. But Madam President, having the SEA exam is not more important than the health of the population. And the government will be guided by the fact that the health of the population will not be sacrificed for the purpose of having the exam. Madam President, just to remind you that the Ministry of Education met with stakeholders on April 22nd, and it was agreed that the exam should be carried out as far as possible in an atmosphere of safety. The Ministry of Education is cognizant of the views, mixed views, in fact, on the public, even mixed views amongst the parents, the teachers, the students, in relation to their personal safety but also in relation to the mental stress and the anxiety caused by delays, the uncertainty, and now the prospect of further delays. So we know that students have been working towards June the 10th, and changing that date will be the very last resort. And the only reason that date would change is in line with the safety of the population in the current environment. So based on this, Madam President, in relation to 
my friend's question. Uh, the final Minister, decision the time has expired. This week. Thank yeah. you. Senator Mark. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, can the Minister indicate to the Senate, given the short time frame between now and the actual proposed date for the holding of this very important examination, does the government intend to take a decision within a specified time frame, whether it's this week, Mr. M Madam President, or next week, let us know. Parents and children. Minister. Madam President, based on the numbers and the and what transpires this week, a final decision would be made and communicated to the public at the end of this week. Thank you. Senator Mark. President, is, can the minister indicate whether it is the intention of the government to hold urgent discussions with the representative union of teachers in this country with a view to arriving at a consensus as it relates to the way forward. Can I ask? Then the Ministry of Education has been, as I said, a meeting was held on April 22nd, and in the normal course, the Ministry of Education has been in touch with the, with the personnel in the schools and also with the union. And given the fact that I've identified that the key concern in April 22nd was the issue of health, the union, the appropriate discussions would be held with the union in the hope of arriving at consensus, Madam President, but in the absence of consensus, the government will do what has to be done in the context of the health of the population. Thank you. Next question, Senator mm -hmm. Mark. To the Prime Minister, in light of the U.S. President's recent announcement to make available to the rest of the world some 80 million COVID-19 vaccines, can the Prime Minister advise whether government has requested a portion of said vaccines? Minister Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Thank you, Madam President. With respect to the urgent question, the answer is yes. The, the, the answer is yes. The Honorable Prime Minister, as the public would be well aware, Madam President, has been the lead with respect to regional and global advocacy on the issue of vaccine access and equity. In that regard, the Prime Minister has followed up directly with President Biden with respect to the provision of vaccines to CARICOM and specifically to Trinidad and Tobago based on the announced initiative from the White House and the administration of the United States. Senator Mark. Thank you, Madam President. Can the Honorable Minister indicate to the Senate, since this announcement by the President of the United States, whether the government has taken any initiatives to contact or to communicate with that administration with a view to addressing the provision of vaccines for the population? of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, it is fully within the public domain that the Honorable Prime Minister and the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs have been robustly and consistently advocating specifically on the issue at reference. The answer again is yes. The Prime Minister has been following up consistently with high-level contacts within the U.S. administration. The Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs has been following up and supporting consistently with high-level contacts via our mission in Washington, D.C. The ambassador there has been fully mobilized and tasked 
to follow up specifically on this new vaccine initiative. Yesterday, immediately subsequent to the, to the announcement by President Biden, I met with the charge of the U.S. Embassy here in Porto, Spain, a direct personal meeting to follow up on the scaling up initiative that, the President, that President Biden has announced. And again, very targeted advocacy continues. I can go further, Madam President. The Prime Minister has been leading the advocacy with contacts such as Maxine Walters, uh, uh, Waters, high-level influential figure in the U.S. administration, with Benny Thompson, high-level influential figure within the U.S. administration, with the Atlantic Council, high-level think tank, very influential within the, the U.S. system. We've written, the Prime Minister has written multiple times to President Biden and has received responses, and that communication and engagement is ongoing. Bear in mind that this 80 million is a scaling up, a welcome scaling up of a prior 60 million that, were announced, that was announced by President Biden. So this is welcome, this is good news for Trinidad and Tobago, and its public servants are well engaged and working hard, pressing home this issue, and we look forward on behalf of this country, on behalf of CARICOM, and yes, Madam President, on behalf of all small developing countries, to bringing home benefits for our people based on this initiative. Sen Senator Mark? Yes, Madam President, can I ask the Honorable Minister, given his recent intervention directly with representatives of the U.S. government via its embassy, can the Minister share with the Senate what specific measures have been taken to ensure that Trinidad and Tobago benefits from this initiative. Is there any initiative, any action plan that the minister would like to share with this parliament and the country that he would have discussed to speed up the provision of said vaccines? Senator Mark, I won't allow that question. Questions or notice questions for oral answer. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, there are three questions on notice for response today, and the government will answer all three. Senator Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, question 101 to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. At this time, the government is not seeking budgetary support or loan financing from any financial institution that requires structural adjustment. Rumors to the contrary, such as those propagated by opposition MPs in March of this year about a World Bank loan for COVID-19 support are completely false. At this time, the government has the capability and the credit worthiness to access financing both locally and internationally, at competitive rates without conditionalities. This fact was demonstrated last year when during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Finance was able to raise US $500 million or TT $3.4 billion in a few hours on the international market at a very competitive rate of 4.5% over 10 years with no conditionalities. This situation has not changed. Senator Mark. Contrary to what my colleague has said, I would like to ask through you, Madam President, whether the Honorable Minister is in agreement with senior economist Dr. Marlene Atz of the University of the West Indies, who has requested the government approach the International Monetary Fund for standby arrangement, given the worsening fiscal deficit and the rising debt ratio to the debt to GDP ratio. Can the Honorable Minister share with us whether he shares that view. Senator Mark, that question does not arise. Madam President, can 
minister indicated this can, to the Senate, given the rising debt, the widening fiscal deficit, and the worsening economic situation in our country, can the minister indicate what specific steps will be taken by the government outside of approaching the IMF to address this looming crisis in our country? Senator Mark, I won't allow that question. Ask the Honorable Minister whether the government has on its radar in the medium term approaching these international institutions for support given the worsening crisis in our country. Senator Mark, that question does not arise based on the question that was posed and the answer that was given. Next question, yes. Question number one or two to the Minister of National Security. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Madam President, Madam President, the government has not commenced any official program aimed at granting resident status to Venezuelans currently residing in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, persons who have legally entered the country and wish to be granted resident status must apply through the Ministry of National Security in the usual way and follow the established procedures. Thank you. Senator Mark. Madam President, can I ask the Honorable Minister whether government's policy in will be adjusted to address granting to these Venezuelans, particularly the 16,000 Venezuelans who have been formally registered in this country, whether it is the intention of the government in the not-too-distant future to provide that resident status to those um, Venezuelans in our country at the moment. Senator Mark, I won't allow that question. Madam President, um, can the minister indicate whether the government will be taking steps in the not-too-distant future, given the circumstances of our situation, to deal with those registered Venezuelans? What exactly would be their status in the coming period, Madam President? Exactly. Would the government be renewing their residential um, their status, or would the government be repatriating these Venezuelans? Senator Mark, that question does not arise. Next question, Senator Mark. Yeah, question number 103 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, in addition to the investigation by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, which is ongoing and which has already led to three persons being charged in this matter to date, an investigation was undertaken by UTT's security and an independent three-person committee was commissioned to conduct an investigation. And that independent committee was commissioned to investigate the circumstances that led to the theft at the current campus, review the role of the campus managers who have oversight responsibility for the assets at the respective campuses, perform a management audit, and make the appropriate recommendations for action and implementation. At this time, Madam President, the committee has reviewed all the relevant processes and policies and interviewed personnel at the current campus and also the two other campuses, that is Point Lisa and San Fernando Technical Institute campus, those two being ones that received items from the current campus. The interviewees are now in the process of verifying the statements that they have provided. And after that process, a final report will be completed and submitted to the president of the UTT. And the submission date expected for that final report is May 28, 2021. Thank you. Senator Ma. President, can the minister indicate what interim measures have been put in place to avoid a repetition of this particular incident? 
Minister. Madam President, as indicated, the three-person independent committee was commissioned to investigate the circumstances, review the role of the campus managers, perform a management audit, and make appropriate recommendations for action and implementation. And it is expected that once the president of the university receives the report, the appropriate actions would be taken. Senator Mark. Whilst we are waiting, Madam President, through you, the question is, whilst we are waiting the submission of this committee's report on the way forward, can the minister indicate to the Senate what interim measures were taken between the period of this incident to the, to the final submission of the report, which is due, as he has indicated, on May the 28th. I won't allow that question because you're just repeating the first supplemental that you asked. Do you have any more questions? Thank you. Public business, government business, bills, second reading. Honorable members, the debate on the second reading of the following bill, which was in progress when the Senate adjourned on Tuesday, May the 11th, 2021, will be resumed. A bill entitled, An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601. We have had seven speakers, seven speakers on this bill, including the mover of the motion. Leader of Government Business. Thank you very much, Madam, Madam President. I can contribute, right, Madam President? Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute on this very important and very topical debate. Madam President, I recognize that a week has passed since the, the mover has spoken and the others because my colleagues in this house have contributed. Madam President, on the last day, as usual, I listened and I took careful note of the submissions. And I intend to first respond to some of the submissions, in particular, what I considered to be, I wanted to say misconceptions, but it must really be misinformation from my colleagues, Senator Mark and Senator Lachmi Dial. I want to do that. I want, secondly, Madam President, to indicate that around the world you would see the various jurisdiction inconsistency in handling of pepper spray and what is described as non-lethal weapons and I want to emphasize that in our country Trinidad and Tobago we have to be very aware of the way we have behaved in the past, the way we behave now, the way we react to legislation, and something I've spoken about, the need sometimes to be so very prescriptive in the way we deal with the law. Difficulty in hearing the words of this very honorable senator. If he could yeah. Thank you very much, Senator. I hope I've cured that and I would, um, I would increase my volume. I take a page from my colleague, Senator Mark. And so the point is that around the world there, there's been this, this struggle, there's inconsistency. And a lot of times what you would find is that based on the state of the society, Sometimes the culture and behavior, it influences the final legislative um, position. And it ranges from those jurisdictions which have a complete ban, those jurisdictions that have very limited legislative control. And in the middle, where we ought to find ourselves, you have those jurisdictions that allow persons to purchase, carry, and in certain circumstances use because those jurisdictions try to strike a balance. And I understand the challenge, particularly the challenge of my colleague Senator Vera. I understand the challenge because there's this belief that pepper spray will solve a significant amount of problems 
and a desire to remove the bureaucracy. But I go back to a position I've articulated twice to say, pepper spray is dangerous, capable of being dangerous, and there must be controls. And perhaps where we will disagree is the extent to which the state must have a strong system of controlling the use of pepper spray. And that is where our disagreements lie. I would refer to a city that is very familiar to me, the city of Surrey in Canada, to demonstrate what some municipalities have had to do. And I would end by talking about some of the challenges in drafting even this bill and taking into consideration all the different views. Madam President, on this misinformation perpetrated by my colleagues, Senator Mark and Lakshmi Dial, you see, I got the impression that, that impression it was very clear to me, listening to the submissions, that life started with Andrea Barrett's demise. And the opposition, the thoughts on pepper spray started then, and I mean no disrespect to Ms. Barrett and her family. No disrespect. And if that is what brought us here, then I'm happy we are here. We need to be here. But I want to just say that there's a legislative history to this that involves both of us, the opposition and the government, to make that very clear. Because the responsibility rests with us now. But my friends on the other side had their chance. And when you go back into the parliamentary record, you would see reference as far as 2003. And I remember that contribution by my colleague, current Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines. 31st October 2003. He was speaking on the Firearms Amendment Bill, and I remember it because on many occasions, Minister Hines, when he talks about national security, goes back to a trip he made to the United States to observe police in action in the United States, visiting um, different uh, police stations and so on. And he talked then, and it resonated with me then as it does now, of what a police officer in the United States look like, because I could also talk about it as part of teaching criminal law in the Canadian environment to my students. I took them too. In fact, when you go up around Canada, you would not see the type of police stations we have here. And I pointed out that to my students very early in the criminal law course, that you wouldn't see that, because the police officer it's like a walk-in police station, and the car is like a support for the police officer. And an RCMP officer in Canada has 68 pieces of equipment on them. In fact, when I was lecturing on the issue of warrants and the issue of warrants by telephone, making a call to a judicial officer for the issue of a warrant to maybe enter premises, and I say to the students that the judicial officer will issue the warrant and the officer will serve the warrant. They were confused. And I had to say to them, which is why I took them to the police car, took the class to the police car. And they saw there was a little printer. In between the seats, there was a laptop with a printer, which allowed a warrant to be printed on something like a receipt. Of course, it, it brought with it the undertaking by the officer that they will provide the full particulars to the issuing judicial officer. But in the case of an emergency, they could do that. And Minister Hines made the point that the police officers he saw in Miami had uniform, bulletproof vest, handcuff, extra ammo, pistol, pepper spray, a short battle, a long battle, radio, and so on. So the idea of pepper spray Coming to Trinidad is not new, Trinidad and Tobago, and Teza is not new. I want to make that first point. I want to make the second point that in the period 2010 to 2015, there was a point when pepper spray was alive, very much alive. Before 
2013 when the current Commissioner of Police, who was then Minister of National Security, before he spoke about pepper spray in 2013 in both houses, it was then Minister of National Security, John Sandy, Brigadier John Sandy, dealing with the bacteriological um, and toxins bill, weapons bill 2011. In March, 20, March 13, 2012, Senator Sandy, as he was then, was talking about, about Trinidad and Tobago in the context of, of these types of weapons. And just in passing, he spoke about how pepper spray could be developed in a school lab. He didn't go anywhere beyond that. In the context of toxins and weapons of that nature, he mentioned pepper spray and he left it as Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. You see, my friends are now coming here to champion the cause of pepper spray. But under a Minister of National Security in 2012, pepper spray just got passing reference in a bill that had no direct relation to pepper spray. Had passing reference. And then it was, and I, and, I, and I commend the current minister, the current commissioner of police, commending for that he's been very consistent. The position he took in 2013 and 2014, he as an individual has been consistent in his support for pepper spray and similar types of devices. And it was in the House, on, on, on the appropriation bill of that year, in the House on 18 September 2013, and in the Senate on 23rd September 2013, that then Minister of National Security, Gary Griffith, introduced, introduced into the Parliament the possible use of pepper spray by law enforcement officers. There was no reference to citizens then. It was the law enforcement officers. And the then minister repeated in 2014 on the same appropriations bill for the 2014 financial year. On 16 September 2014, he went into some detail. And this is what he was talking about. He was talking about government. He said the purpose of government is to provide the assets, the policies, and the framework for law enforcement officers to work. That was the purpose of the government. He was talking about indoor training ranges. And he went to where Minister Hines had been in 2003. And he made the point that at that time, a police officer moved from Bato to Fayam. Those were the two options. I say the RCMP officer has 68 pieces of things on them. But all police officers had Bato and Fayam. And if we check the issue of police shootings, we would realize, we would realize that a contributory factor has to be the tools available to the police. And Minister Griffith, as he was then, talked about a communication system being available to the police officer. Bato, pepper spray, tasers, and firearms as a last resort. So, I wanted my friends to understand that it was very, very alive. And in 2014, it was only in the context of law enforcement. Now, why I went back there was because of the link to the Andrea Barrett incident. So when I was writing for the Express, I always found it um, disconcerting when there will be a particular murder, a particular criminal act that brought all the politicians alert and so on. And I wondered, how do we pick the ones? How do we decide the ones which affect us? They all, they all affect some family, and they affect neighbors and relatives and citizens. And we should be, all be concerned about all of them. And it was not, because if the recent murders and the recent attacks on women and so on caused us to have an urgency with pepper spray, I don't like to go back too, far, too much into the history, but I'll tell you this. Around the time when Minister of National Security Griffith, as he was then, 2013, was talking about pepper spray for law enforcement, this is one of the most vicious murders I have read about in this country. 
and it involves, this is a report by Yvonne Webb in The Guardian of 2nd February 2013, and my colleague, Senator Thompson I would know this one very, very much because she was out of the country at the time, was around Carnival time that year. You were out of the country and you actually wrote a letter to the editor on this matter. And this matter had to do the, with the couple. The couple, a 36-year-old woman who had gone with a male companion to the Apostle Ministries at Amarasing Street in Longdonville. And during a period of counseling, she went to the bathroom at the, at the church and was followed by the man with whom she came for counseling and stabbed several times and she died on the spot. And I would think that that may give rise in the context of the discussion at the time on pepper spray to law enforcement. I would think that the door was open in that murder, more open than anyone now, to understand in closed, unguarded circumstances that Ramona Chacon found herself that day in Longlandville. Pepper spray would have been a good intervention if she had it. And that one and the recent murders are indistinguishable in the context. So my friends should not come here, should not come here and mount the holy ground and place the responsibility squarely on us. They have, and you have your chance today. You have your chance today. Eight years after, eight years after, you failed because from 2013 when it first went on the record via your Minister of National Security at the time, you had sufficient time. In fact, you had two and a half years, two and a half years, and you did absolutely nothing. I've checked the records with the Chief Parliamentary Council. I've checked Hansard. I've checked your manifesto of 2010 and 2015. I will point you to members of the United National Congress. I want you to go to your manifesto of 2015. And where you dealt with national security and crime, the word woman, woman or female was never mentioned. You had 20 areas identified. You had 20 achievements in relation to national security and crime in your manifesto identified. And protection of women and changes to domestic violence legislation appears nowhere. Nowhere in your manifesto. After five years and three months in government, seeking re-election, you had absolutely nothing to say to the women of this country on their safety and security. And you come here and lecture to me and to this bench and this country on how urgent this pepper spray is. But let me tell you something, it's urgent. And you will stay here today and pass the bill with us. It's urgent. We come here to work. You had your chance. You had your chance, let me tell you this. Suzanne Mohammed, writing in the Express, this is, one of the, this is one of the most gruesome murders in this country. Most gruesome murders. Four men enter in a house. This was in 2003, when you're talking about pepper spray for law enforcement. This is a woman chopped to death in the presence of her children, screaming as she was chopped for her children and for her neighbors to come to her rescue. And you did not see it fit with your special majority, with millions flowing, with the brightest lawyers around you. Senator Lachmi Dial was right up close and inside the office of the Attorney General. I would not allow you to moralize to me on this matter. I would not allow you to do that. You had your chance. 
And not many of us have a second bite. You have a second bite at it today. Because you did not put it in your manifesto. You did not put it in a policy document. Nowhere have you mentioned pepper spray as a form of defense for women. Nowhere. Until Andrea Barrett's death. Absolutely nowhere. So you have been brought here today. You have been brought here today to pass this legislation. And we will stay here as long as it takes to pass this. Let us see who want to pass it today. It was in 2017 because I mentioned it before. I was there in the house. I was there in the house sitting directly behind the Prime Minister. And Prime Minister was asked a question by MP Ramona Ramdial, as she then was, 1st September, 15th September 2017. And she asked, are there any plans for citizens, particularly women, to be allowed to carry tasers and pepper spray as a measure of personal protection in light of 40 women being murdered for the year already? Prime Minister is very clear. The Commissioner of Police is actively considering the use of non-lethal weapons for citizens, women, and particularly the security services. That was 2017. And it is that, it is that which the Prime Minister referred to in the hands of the Commissioner of Police that led to December 2020 when we saw and later the newspaper reported and have referred to it the use of a taser by a police officer in this country in a criminal situation, encounter with criminals. And at the same time, at the same time, it was in the appropriations bill, the appropriations bill in 2018, October 2018, that asked that in, 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 in dealing with his contribution, the Minister of National Security said, you will see the use of non-lethal weapons by the police service, defense force, prison service, tasers, rubber bullets, and pepper spray. That was 2018. That was 2018. Setting in train a policy that brought it first to law enforcement as articulated. Prime Minister said it in 2017. The minister says it to the country in 2018. And in 2019, in the Standing Committee on Finance, it was MP for Princess Town, Larry Padarat, who asked the Minister of, of National Security in relation to line item 0300104, minor equipment, he asked, what is the minor equipment for? And the response from then Minister Stuart Young was, tasers pepper spray, surveillance equipment, bulletproof vests, utility belts, routers, switches, body-worn cameras, tasers, law enforcement, articulating, not getting up, not getting up because you find yourself in a gruesome murder that fits your circumstances for publicity. You insert yourself in that. You insert yourself in that. Gather people, encourage people from all over the country to come and light candle and walk. Forgetting in 2013, there are enough murders to cause you to do. You had two and a half years, two and a half years after that murder in Longdenville, and you did absolutely nothing. We have articulated, and what we've brought the Senate here for, for the second week on, is on this bill that the police commissioner has addressed the needs of the police service, and we must now address the needs of the nation as a whole, including law enforcement. That is our purpose here. That is our purpose here. And we have to do what we have to do. We have to do. We come to work, and today is the day when we deal with this, and we leave here knowing as a Senate that we have done in this house what we have the capacity to do. And we will disagree. None of us here will disagree on the introduction of pepper spray 
as a form of personal defense in this country. None of us here are arguing against that. Nobody has come to say no pepper spray. All of us have come here to work down the middle. And down the middle is where we say, you will have access to the pepper spray. You'll be able to buy it, carry it, import it, use it. But you will do so in certain circumstances. And we have an opportunity in committee stage. The AG will address when he does the winding up, he'll address the issue of amendments. And you have the opportunity in full view of the country that is watching and listening, you have the opportunity to make your submissions on the balance that must be struck, because that is what this debate is about. There's no de de debate about the introduction of pepper spray. That is what the debate is about. And I referred to, for example, the city of Surrey. When I moved to Canada, the first place I, I lived was in that city of Surrey. And Madam President, I encourage all my colleagues here, particularly on the independent bench, particularly Senator Vieira. The reason I say we have to be mindful of our culture in this country, seatbelt law, you still have people in this country driving without seatbelts. You still have that. We bought 30 years into seatbelt law. In fact, wearing of seatbelt in the rear seat has become more important than wearing of seatbelt in the front seat. The body becomes a missile. We still can't buckle a seatbelt when we enter a vehicle. Cell phone, the use of cell phones when you drive in. We had to strengthen and bring in the demerit system to strengthen that law and to make it create a real prospect of not being able to, 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 to have a permit after achieving a certain amount of points. We had a, a case on the newspaper <coughs> last week of a fellow. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you. A gentleman who had already lost his license driving without a license so that litter how many years, how many decades after Chase Charlie away, how many decades since we put a $500 on offense on, on the books? And people in this country cannot put a piece of paper in a dustbin. Tobacco. How many years after we banned smoking in public places? Smoking remain a very pervasive thing in this country. A very pervasive thing in this country in public places. And on the issue of health and wellness, I had a lady posting on Facebook and asking me, why don't I give an incentive for people to eat properly in this country? And I asked her, you're not seeing enough limbs being lost to diabetes? And how much money as a nation we're spending on open heart surgery? You have not seen the records which tell us we're spending 40 million as taxpayers on diabetic testing strips in a country that we give freely testing strips and testing devices but offer no subsidy on gyms. A country where we incentivize ill health and we do not reward people who maintain the, the, the health conditions. And that is why I say this law has to be prescriptive. Otherwise, our culture you Google Suri pepper spray, and you'll see how pervasive it is in a country where you have bear spray and pepper spray, not because of crime, but because of animals, that so many criminals use pepper spray. And that is why, far back as 1998, that city had to put in place strict controls on the sale of pepper spray to address the, the cultural and behavioral circumstances in their city. And today, we have a responsibility to deal with this bill, not in the context of the need for it, but the need for balance, and balance in the context of what could happen if we do not become prescriptive and strict in giving the opportunity to use pepper spray. Because I have said it, and I repeat it, pepper spray in the wrong hands, in the wrong circumstances, could be a lethal weapon. Thank you very much, Madam President.
May I ask who wishes to speak? If no one, I will call on the Attorney General to wind up. Senator Nackett. Madam President, once again, I thank you for the opportunity to join this debate on the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021. But first, I'd like to register my deep disappointment that we as a people, as a country, as a government, has not issued any statement on the continued massacre and killing of Palestinian children in Gaza. I think it would, be, it would be remiss of us as a body, an austere body, not to recognize that 68 children have been killed in one week and 16 women with over 1,400 people being seriously injured. We would hope that the government in representing the soul of our nation, that some statement would be soon forthcoming. Madam President, also I would like to say that given the dire situation that our country finds itself within this COVID-19 embrace, that it's a pity that we could not have the leader of government business perhaps think a bit outside the box in terms of having this Senate sitting like so many other parliaments have done. Now, I would not place any extraordinary thinking or to go outside the boundaries of intelligence on this particular leader of government business since he does not have the capacity to do so. But it would have been quite easy to have some kind of video conferencing to replace what we have here, especially since we've had to bring out workers, personnel, Senate clerks, putting everyone's life in danger. I would just like to register that, Madam President. Madam President, we just heard from the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, and, his, and in his Don Quixote-like presentation, where he flailed at windmills and perceived enemies, it was quite disappointing since we never got to the crux of the bill and the things and the details of, of it. For one, I find myself in a position of commending Senator Vera on his presentation, which I found to be the most comprehensive presentation that we've heard. I found the detailed, challenging, informative, and I think that should have sent a signal to this government that we are on our way to some kind of bipartisan or tripartisan approach to how we deal with pepper spray and with this bill. When I listen now, unfortunately, to the inanities uttered by the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fishery, I am not surprised. He spoke about the opposition having two and a half years and spoke quite extensively about that. And then I was moved to ask, is this not the same government that has had, has had six and a half years? So that, that uh, not surprising, but indeed disappointing. 
So it looks like this Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries continues to insist on being a meme. How insensitive, how callous to refer to Andrea Barrett's death in that way. If she was indeed the spark, if the candlelight movement was indeed the spark to get us to this point, shouldn't we be appreciative of that? Not of her death, but of the consequences of it. But he flailed about in his criticism, never really get into any particular point that we could coalesce about, coalesce about, that we could discuss or debate. It was a rant against the opposition. And again, in our, according to him, our inability to move in two and a half years. And I repeat, on a bill that has, it seems to me, tripartisan support, that they've had six and a half years and have done nothing. He pleaded no disrespect, but then went on to be quite disrespectful. Not realizing that Senator Vera insistent, insistence on this not becoming too bureaucratic a process has several layers to that. And as with this government, we should always be circums circumspect about anything that involves bureaucracy because it then it becomes a process that can be monetized. And as, as we've seen in procuring vaccinations. So I think Senator or Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries was way off point, way off course, and I think in retrospect, Canada, Canada's gain is Trinidad and Tobago's loss. Madam President, I refer to the bill in Article 24 of the Essentials, where it seems that the bill places the Commissioner of Police in the most difficult of positions in determining if the applicant is of unsound mind or has intemperate habits. Is the commissioner of police not required to be a registered psychologist or psychotherapist? Within what time frame will that assessment place upon the COP be given? Shouldn't the provision be that the commissioner of police refers anybody he deems to be of unsung mind and has, according to him, intemperate habits, shouldn't that be person be referred to the medical professionals for evaluation? That would avoid the appearance of bias and become wholly transparent in the process. And that is an issue of mental health that we need to take seriously. You cannot place the commissioner of police in a situation where he thereby has to evaluate the mental health of someone. That is not his remit. So I think that should be completely um, amended. If you want to give the COP powers of discretion, why not give the Commissioner of Police powers of discretion for matters that he's indeed qualified for? Instead of possible health matters, mental health matters, we have, by way of practical example, there are women in this country who have convictions for offenses where they pleaded guilty or took the rap, as we say, to protect a boyfriend, a family member who has a criminal record and who would have been faced with a heavy jail time if they owned up. 
Many women, because they have no previous criminal history, are made to sacrifice themselves. Because of the way the bill is framed, these women, many of whom may be in the same relationship or may have moved on to another relationship, are debarred from applying for a permit and would never have protection because of a bad choice they once made or forced to make in the past. And they would be like sitting ducks when faced with attack, without the power of protection. If we want to give the Commissioner of Police powers of discretion, should we not give it in this case, where he can look on each of these cases on a case-by-case -case basis, since the primary objective should be to enable women to protect themselves? If the Commissioner refuses then to allow them to appeal to a firearms appeal board or similar board, so that individual cases can be considered as opposed to being hamstrung by a bill which doesn't allow for the reasonable, reasonable exercise of discretion by the COP or reviewing body. Madam President, as I said before, I thought Senator Vera, who sometimes I'm not in line with, in terms of his perspective, but his contribution, which I listened to and enjoyed, was on point. The only thing that I had a problem with, which would require further explanation from the goodly senator, was the strength of the, of the pepper tree, the, potent, the potency of it. Because I think, in my humble opinion, Senator, that the pepper spray, despite what we may have heard, its initial impact is what is important. Its initial impact is what stops the attacker, the person with criminal intent. And that's what we have to be mindful of. So then that means we have to take it in its full potency if we are to protect our women. We can't hope for some kind of intervention from somebody to help. We have to imagine worst case scenarios in these instances. So when we hear the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries speak about we have to understand the culture. Well, if we talk about our culture, then we should give them more than pepper sprays. Because isn't it the same people we are talking about and we refer to the same people who have our women seemingly as hostages throughout the country? What, are we going to give them water down, pepper spray? No, I think we need to be firm with it. We need to have the highest potency available for them. And again, to remove the bureaucracy that allow these women to take care of themselves and protect themselves. So. My issue, in addition to what Senator Vera said, is only about we must not allow this to be monetized in a way that, and in a time frame that does not benefit the people that we intend to protect. And two, we must allow, in matters other than mental health, a discretionary power to the Commissioner of Police on a case-by-case -case situation. Again, in reference to the goodly minister, I'd like to inform him, inform him Minister Rambarat, Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, that there's no, there's no need to make adversaries and opponents where there's none. His vehemency in advocating whatever he advocated, I am still bemused, he will find no opposition here. Other than a few amendments that we would like to see, we are the ones who insisted upon this, whether it was two and a half years or whether it was six and a half years. 
What we look forward to is to have this operationalized as soon as possible so that we together can offer the women of Trinidad and Tobago a viable solution to protect themselves. I thank you, Madam President. Senator Welch. Madam President, thank you for the opportunity to address this House on this very important issue. Madam President, I, be, I often like to begin with the principle that a government is responsible constitutionally for the good governance of the country. And that involves ensuring the safety of citizens assessing circumstances which arise and dealing with them by principle, by law, and putting measures and policies in place to address the situation. The current situation is one which warrants a measure and it is overdue for the institution of some meaningful approach in addition to what already exists. There is clearly a need for something additional, more than what we have been doing uh, in this society. M Madam President, violence against women, be it murder, be it wanton violence, be it disfigurement, be it attacks on women, is nothing new in our society. I know a lot of persons have spoken about the recent, some of the recent murders, but it is a problem which has existed, I would say, almost from time immemorial. And I emphasize that to show that the historical nature of it is such that it needs to be addressed now. And let's use this opportunity now to address it in a meaningful way. Uh, Madam President, when I, um, when I recall speaking of historical nature, I recall that when I just became a prosecutor at the DPP's office, which was almost uh, 30 years ago, there is a case which left an indelible mark on my memory. And it involved a young lady who was walking along Independence Square saw two friends that she was familiar with in a vehicle. And those gentlemen offered her to go on a line with them and then to take her home. And because she knew them, she got into that vehicle. To cut through the chase, she ended up raped in Macarip, left naked on a lonely road to die with several chops to her head. Her survival was a miracle. Fortunately, the gentlemen were prosecuted and justice was done. Madam President, there had been more, even more recent cases. I also recall as an attorney, when I first used to attend the Hall of Justice, there was some damage to carpet on the ground in a particular area of the Hall of Justice. And when, as a person, you now go there for the first time, you ask yourself, why is this carpet looking like this, damaged in this particular area? And then someone with greater experience would explain that in a family matter involving husband and wife, back then the family court was located at the Hall of Justice, a husband, after matrimonial proceedings, attacked his wife in the very hall of justice, throwing some kind of corrosive liquid on her. And some of that liquid fell on the ground and eroded and damaged the carpet. And this was quite some time ago as well, again in the 90s. 
We also had a situation in Valsain, again court-related, and again involving a husband and wife, where she went in the company of Marshall and court officials to remove certain items from, from the matrimonial home in divorce-related proceedings. He locked her into a room in the presence of court officials where they couldn't gain access and proceeded to chop her to death. So what we are talking about, I bring up these examples to demonstrate that it is not a recent phenomenon at all. More recently, we've had the murder of the, um, the well-known murder of the Japanese girl at, um, who was found in the Savannah. There were also other situations Apart from Angela um, Barrett, who was merely taking a taxi, we also had Shannon B Banfield, who was merely shopping on Charlotte Street. All innocent, all innocent actions. There was also the young Venezuelan somewhere in the countryside who was simply taking a taxi to go and sell um, goods and was attacked by those persons. So I emphasize this to show the need for something urgent, and it must be done here and now. Madam President, it is not enough that sometimes arrests are made and justice is done after the fact. J well, all that is well and good. Even when justice is done, it does not bring back a life. And in those instances where a murder didn't occur, it nevertheless it doesn't restore the dignity of the female who has been attacked, even where she remains alive. It doesn't repair the psychological damage and arrest and conviction. It doesn't repair the psychological damage. So what? We need, in addition to those measures, is something more. Many of these attacks are unpredictable, unanticipated, and they occur away from the public gear, glare, away from law enforcement, in a lonely street, in a car, where a young lady or adult may be defenseless. Therefore, what is needed, and any sensible person would appreciate that women and vulnerable persons need to be enabled to defend themselves because the circumstances in which these occur are unexpected and would not be catered for. You are taken by surprise, and therefore, they need to be armed, and therefore, it may not work, but in some instances, it may well do. In that context, I consider, I consider that pepper spray, the Pepper Spray Initiative, which would allow for the carrying of this non-lethal by nature device to be an ideal um, position and measure to allow for its carrying for self-defense purposes. It is ideal in the sense that it would occasion secure, se severe inconvenience to a would-be attacker. It is easily deployable. It is convenient to hold. It is convenient to pull out. It is convenient to use. It may give a victim that window of opportunity to send a text to delay the attack, to jump out a window, to open a car door and run, or to even retaliate on her attacker. And important as well is that, why it is convenient and practical, is that generally speaking, as far as I'm aware and my research has shown, it does not do any permanent damage when deployed on an attacker. It doesn't kill, it doesn't cause grievous bodily harm. It has no lasting effect as such. It is a dramatic effect, but it is transient and temporary in nature. 
a disablement which is not permanent, and therefore it is non-lethal. I say all of this to make the point that we need as far as possible, and the philosophy and approach should be one where the aim is to liberalize it as much as possible and put it in the hands of women and vulnerable persons as much as possible. The aim should be on liberalization rather than on restriction. It should not lean in favor of conservatism and limitations, but rather the ability to acquire, possess, and even transfer it with such restrictions that are practical and reasonably necessary and which do not go beyond what is called for. So in that regard, the, legis the proposed legislation by the Attorney General, I respect as well-intentioned and I also view it and I am sure the government perceives that it is fulfilling its mandate to deal with this situation and it is acting with proper motives. I have absolutely no doubt about that. But certainly in my per perspective, that is not the litmus test. It is not what you intend but the effect of the provisions themselves. And in that regard, um, Madam President, the effect of this legislation concerns me in that pepper spray is being treated almost like a lethal weapon. The philosophy of the effect of the legislation and its substance does not appear contrary to its intention to liberalize and to put it in the hands of as many persons as possible so that they may have this last measure of defense. Rather, looking at this, these legislative provisions, one would be forgiven for thinking that pepper spray is something new that has now come onto the horizon. It, uh, it has proven to be extremely dangerous. It has been used in a manner which is adverse to society. It has been used to kill, disfigure, maim, and therefore there is a need to prohibit it. This legislation sp speaks to prohibition and severe limitations with few exceptions. Whereas what we need is liberalization and such limitations as are only necessary for the purpose. So, before looking at why I have assessed the legislative measures from that perspective, let me first, Madam President, propose what I think might be the ideal approach. It may sound radical, I agree, but having regard to the history that I have outlined, let us give it a try. And if need be, if it proves to be a problem, we can always return to deal with the problems that have developed after we have given it a try. So I suggest that, <clears throat> I suggest that pepper spray in an approved amount and intensity and with a certain amount of toxicity that is approved by the minister that it does not go beyond the grade required for self-defense, 
or inflict a permanent damage, that we liberalize it and we allow persons to acquire and purchase it from a recognized dealer without all these bureaucratic measures without requiring a permit. You go and you purchase it. Now, I, am, I fully understand the position of the Attorney General because that sounds uh, radical. I also listened to the Minister of Agriculture and he has spoken to the experience in Canada where he has lived and where the use of it became in such a manner that it had to be restricted. Well, I say Canada is Canada. Let's give our society a chance because of what is happening here historically and what is happening presently because it has not changed. So, I, so my submission is that we have this legislation in such a way that it is liberalized, that it is decriminalized because presently it, uh, uh, um, using the definition in the Firearms Act, it will be regarded as a prohibited weapon. So declassify it as such, allow its purchase, acquisition, and transfer, and put in certain limitations to take care of the concerns with which um, one is worried about. So for instance, you can have an age limit for its acquisition, and I suggest 16 years. Let, the, let any proposed legislation reflect, which this one does to some extent. If it is used to commit a crime, then that is an offense. If someone who purchases pepper spray over the counter, brandishes that pepper spray in public when it is not necessary, you can make that an offense. You can prohibit some persons from being able to acquire pepper spray, and if they do purchase or possess it, make that an offense as well. Persons who have offenses, charges of violence, under the Domestic Violence Act or under the Offenses Against the Persons Act. You can make it an offense for a convicted person for certain class of offenses to possess it as well. And even if you are not convicted, but you are charged with violent offenses, make it an offense for such a person to go and uh, purchase it or acquire it or have it in their possession. Once you have put these limited, limiting measures in place, I submit, as um, my goodly colleague, um, Senator Verrett, um, strongly suggested, liberalize it and allow it to, to be purchased. Your concern that criminals may use it is balanced by the fact that criminals will tend to use heavier weapons to carry out their enterprises. And, and that may be overridden by having a number of our vulnerable persons having it in their possession. The advantage of having such persons having it in, in their possession perhaps outweighs the disadvantage of criminals having, having that. They may look at that as a toy because they deal with guns. They deal with tight straps. They deal with knives. They operate in gangs. So pepper spray is a toy to them. So I submit um, for the Attorney General's consideration, who I must commend because he has demonstrated the sensitivity when it comes to making amendments and taking them on board, I submit these considerations for his, for his consideration. Now, to give an illustration of my concerns with the legislation, which I have alluded to, I will 
point them out in summary fashion. First of all, you have to have a permit or license from the commissioner of police or someone authorized by him. That is the same you are now treating pepper spray like a firearm. They are in two different categories. So a person who wants to protect themselves now has to go through that bureaucratic process to the same commissioner who gives a permit for firearms. And we know there is a long history of complaints about how long I have to wait for my firearm license, how many times I have to call the station. And when you eventually do get it, it's probably several months or a year later. And there are allegations of corruption. Why are we subjecting the vulnerable, if this is supposed to be legislation aimed at their protection, to such measures? It is also counterproductive. It is also self potentially self-defeating. Because, as the Minister of Agriculture speaks about culture, Another aspect of our culture is that if women now believe that I have to go into a police station to line up and wait until six or seven other people finish make their reports, to fill out a form to get a pepper spray license, to be told that the officer who is supposed to be taking the report isn't here and come back at 3 o'clock. And then by the time you go through all of that process and you finally find the authorized officer and you fill out whatever form, you are told we will hear from you but we can't guarantee you exactly when because we have a number of other applications pending or alternatively, the same persons who are granting firearm users license under the legislation is the same person who is to grant a pepper spray a permit. And therefore, you have to stand in line. First come, first serve. What I know of our culture, I would think, women would say, I not going through that. Better I walk with my little knife that I'm accustomed to walking with, or my switchblade, or whatever is the case, and hope it provides protection. Because while this may sound all well and good on paper, I can see the, bureauc the bureaucracy and the red tape and the delays would be such that it would be a turn off to people. Legislative provision should be such that it encourages and makes it easy the process of acquiring and possessing and be not subject to this approach in our society, which unfortunately does not function well when it comes to efficiency and procedures and processing of applications. So the notion of getting a permit from the commissioner of police or his assigned person, in my view, should be abandoned. Pepper spray is not so bad. It is not so lethal to warrant this treatment like you would for a firearm. Give it a chance. If it doesn't work, we come back here. But to not give it a chance and to adv advance this legislation as it is, is to discourage women from acquiring and self-defeating, as, as I've said. But not only that, not only must you get the p permit or uh, firearm, but According to, the, according to the, 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 the very said clause in the bill, you have to satisfy the commissioner of police that you have good reason for it. 
And the Attorney General, I recall during his contribution, made mention of the fact that, for instance, you are in a domestic violence situation. But please, you have to take note that there are several persons who may not have been able to satisfy this requirement of good reason for it. When, when um, the young lady, Andrea Barrett, got into a car believing it is not a dangerous situation, she would not have thought that she had good reason for it. When Shannon Banfield was merely doing shopping, she would not have thought that she had Senator good reason Welch. for it. Senator Welch, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. So why you have to have a permit, you now have to go and demonstrate and illustrate to the officer you have good reason for it. That in itself is another hurdle. And even if you satisfy the officer that you have good reason for it, there are many grounds on which the officer can refuse. If, you have in, if he comes to the belief or conclusion, it doesn't say it has to be based on any particular grounds, but if he comes to the belief or conclusion just on watching you, that you are of intemperate habits, or on sound mind, or for any other reason not specified, he believes it poses a danger, then you can be refused. So having gone to the station, you go there with the possibility that you will be refused. Then there is also the um, provision that you must have your permit on you at all times. So if you can't find this inconvenient piece of paper, or you misplace it, but you need to go out in the night or go and take up the night shift, you have to leave your um, pepper spray behind. There is also the um, position that you may be stopped and randomly searched by an officer who sees you with pepper spray, and he may demand your license or your permission and if you don't have it on you, you may be even arrested without a warrant. This isn't sounding like enabling provisions. It is sounding like disabling and discouraging provisions. And if you transfer it to anybody else or a family member, you are likely to be charged. So every member of a household must get this, pe this permit. So a sister can't lend it to her sister who works on the night shift or whatever. Let's have a provision instead whereby if one person has a, a pepper spray, he, that person can transfer it to another member of their household. And then the, the sentences on summary conviction for, um, for possessing it, um, if you have supplied false information, it's $500,000, an imprisonment for five years on summary conviction, if you supply false information in your application. On indictment, it is $750,000. What is this over-the-top penalties are about, these disproportionate penalties? For possession, if your permit expires and you forgot to renew it, then you are in possession and... For possession, you can be sentenced on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 or imprisonment for five years. You compare that with firearm, on summary conviction, a fine of $15,000 and imprisonment for eight years. So pepper spray is being treated with greater penalty than firearms. Madam President, in the final analysis, I would say, with respect to this legislation, it, I may lend my support to it when, if it comes to that, but it is not out of uh, any view that I consider it to be appropriate. It is only from the perspective that this is what we have before us, and I do not know how long it may take in the future again 
to revamp it and come with something more appropriate. So in those circumstances, it's possible that I may very well lend my support to it, but I would like it to be understood that this is not the appropriate legislative measure. And to use a colloquial expression, the Attorney General probably needs to wheel and come again. We need something better than this, and it ought not to be part of an amendment to the firearms legislation to bring it within the firearm provisions and structures. It should be something new. Call it the Pepper Spray Liberalization Act or something of that nature. Madam President, thank you very much. Senator Timal. Madam President, <clears throat> I thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this bill that is before this honorable house. Madam President, the catalyst for this legislation before us is undoubtedly the recent murder of Andrea Barrett, Ashanti Riley, and others that precipitated mass agitation and vigils throughout the country. By classifying pepper spray as a prohibited weapon and bringing it within the ambit of regulatory permits, it makes the process of owning and using pepper spray for self-defense quite onerous and seemingly puts it beyond the reach of the average vulnerable woman for whose benefit this is intended. And I must say at this time, Madam President, that I agree totally with Senator Welsh in terms of his comments and his contribution regarding how restrictive this legislation that is before us is and how much it works against putting pepper spray in the hands of our vulnerable women easily. <clears throat> Coupled with the onerous provisions of this legislation for members of the public to own pepper spray, users of pepper spray will have the added burden of proving self-defense as clause 12 of the proposed bill, section 2, clearly states that a person authorized to purchase, acquire, or have in his possession pepper spray shall only use the pepper spray in self-defense. Madam President, the main concern when using pepper spray for self-defense is whether or not using it would be considered excessive force. 
My understanding when engaging in self-defense, the person must use only an amount of force that is equal to the force being used against them. Thus, the use of pepper spray is usually allowed as a form of self-defense in situations where the attacker is threatening serious harm or injury, the attacker has a weapon, the attacker is much larger in size or has specific training that makes them more dangerous, the attacker is also using pepper spray, and there are multiple attackers. As in any self-defense case, the person claiming self-defense cannot be the initiator of the attack or aggression. And I wonder about the dilemma of person, particularly woman who is in a difficult situation, cannot be the in initiator of the attack or aggression, even though she is in possession of pepper spray. That is, they cannot be the one who started the fight, altercation or attack, if they want to claim self-defense in court. In cases where a person uses pepper spray on someone who is not clearly about to attack them, or is showing, not showing any signs of aggression or assault, may face difficulties when claiming the use of pepper spray for self-defense. This reality necessitates the need for appropriate training for owners of pepper spray in its proper and legal use. And the question is asked, I would like to ask the question, what extent of training would be required for someone to obtain the pepper spray permit and use pepper spray legally so that they do not place themselves at legal risk for wrongful use? And would this be addressed <clears throat> in the relevant regulations to go with this bill? Madam President, one of the main reasons put forward for legislating pepper spray as a prohibited weapon is to prevent its use by criminals. And this was mentioned by uh, Senator Vieira in his contribution and briefly also by Senator Welsh. And this, and I agree with them that we cannot readily conclude that pepper spray would be used extensively by criminals. And as a result, the way that this legislation is crafted is questionable in this regard. Madam President, to do so would be to the detriment of passing legislation that is not user-friendly for vulnerable women to acquire and use pepper spray by bringing such legislation under the ambit of a prohibited weapon, as we see in the case here. What has presented criminals from using pepper spray in the past? Is it that the means to get it in the, into the country or manufacture it locally has prevented them from using pepper spray? It would be quite a stretch to think that criminals have not used pepper spray in the past and would suddenly start to do so illegally when we pass go, um, legislation governing its use. Madam President, it, it appears that the biggest beneficiary of the proposed use of pepper spray under this proposed bill will be the police. <clears throat> Since the provisions for use of pepper spray by the police seems to be decidedly less onerous than the restrictions being placed on vulnerable members, members of the public. Clause 6 allows for the police officer, member of the Defense Force Custom Officer, other law enforcement officers to use pepper spray in their respective capacities and propose clause 6, 2A, extends this full capacity to estate police, special reserve officers, municipal police officers, and any other person approved by the minister by order. Why? What it is that falls within the duties and the responsibilities of all these respective law enforcement officers that automatically places pepper spray in their hands. 
This provides a rather wide-ranging array of possibilities of use, and I question whether the bill should be specific about the particular applications for use of pepper spray by law enforcement officers, or whether the intention is to adequately cover the possible uses in the regulations proposed under Clause 22 of the bill. In most jurisdictions that allow the use of pepper spray by law enforcement, the focus is on the use for crowd control during periods of public gatherings and demonstrations. The use of pepper spray is not allowed in circumstances that amount to unwarranted and excessive use of force in situations that are definitely not life-threatening. It therefore amounts to excessive use of force as there is no direct threat to the welfare of the law enforcement officer. So it's a question of the welfare of the law enforcement officer or the use of the pepper spray to, to, um, to disperse crowds, uh, demonstrations, and gatherings along those lines. In my understanding, pepper spray, Madam President, was originally introduced in certain jurisdictions as an alternative to the use of lethal force with firearms in situations which involve a risk to the life of police officers. The circumstances in play are the vast majority of process demonstrations and public gatherings, particularly here in Trinidad and Tobago, and the Minister of Agriculture did refer to our culture here. And uh, in terms of public demonstrations and public gatherings, could hardly warrant the use of this pepper spray. On that basis, I suggest that the use of pepper spray in the context of policing public gatherings would amount to excessive and unnecessary use of force and could involve an attempt to inflict torture or severe pain in certain circumstances, particularly so if it is used on persons who merely offer passive resistance as a demonstration methodology, such as, you know, hanging, hanging limp, or simply refusing to comply with police instructions. I recommend, therefore, that the use of pepper spray in the context of policing public gatherings be prohibited unless exceptional and extreme circumstances are in play and these are clearly identified in the regulations to go with this bill. Madam President, there are concerns about assumptions that pepper spray is inherently, inherently safe because it's naturally derived. There's a report on the risks of the use of capsicum spray and pain compliance techniques against public gatherings Police powers of crowd control is a submission to the ACT Legislative Assembly Legal Affairs Australia Committee Inquiry of June 2005. And Madam President, just to extract some points that are, was made in that particular report, that particular committee inquiry report about the health aspects, the health risks associated with indiscriminate use of pepper spray. The report says, on the contrary, capsaicin, the active ingredient in capsicum gas, is potentially le lethal in its own right. Evidence of great health risk posed by capsicum gas to such people as those suffering heart and respiratory disease, asthmatics, and pregnant women led to the British Home Office abandoning its adoption as a weapon. There is considerable event, evidence of dangers when used against persons with respiratory problems, children and pregnant women. This literature, sorry, whilst use of the pepper spray may be effective and provide additional safety to enforcing officers, Studies indicate that exposure to pepper spray, when combined with pre-existing respiratory difficulties and asthma, can lead to fatalities. 
Moreover, although pepper spray produces the same debilitating reaction on most people exposed to it, close range or long-term exposure may require hospitalization or physical rehabilitation. And members of these populations often have physiological or mental impairments that render them especially susceptible to permanent injury or death following the use of non-lethal weapons. Um, end of my reference to that report, Madam President. Madam President, this is why the regulations referred to in Clause 22 of this bill must be subjected to affirmative resolution of Parliament and not negative resolution as proposed. Appropriate training for its use must also be given to law enforcement officers for its use before issue. And the type of training required for law enforcement officers who are being issued pepper spray should also be clearly, clearly, clearly detailed in the regulations of this bill, Madam President. Oh, sorry, um, Mr. Vice President. I submit that the establishment and implementation of proper re regulations for controlling the use of pepper spray by police officers would benefit both the police and the public. The public will receive some measure of protection against the excessive use of pepper spray, and the police would be given much needed guidance reg regarding the use of the substance. And finally, the state may limit the risk of having to compensate those against whom pepper spray was improperly used. <coughs> Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President, because of the dualistic use of pepper spray as proposed in this bill for two distinct bodies, the public and the police, with significantly differing reasons for possible use. I am not surprised by the rather broad definition of pepper spray proposed in Section 3. And Senator Vieira did mention uh, this in his contribution. Particularly, I think, if I recall correctly, when he um, referred to one as use as a sword and using pepper spray as a shield, and that dichotomy in the use of this pepper spray, and uh, the resulting, resulting from the differing use, uses of pepper spray. Um, I share his concerns. I assume that the saving grace here would be the type of pepper spray would be prescribed by the order made by the minister mentioned in Clause 3 E, Roman 2. And based on the concerns I have expressed regarding inappropriate use by police, the health risks involved for those who are sprayed, etc., et the type of pepper spray to be prescribed by the minister by order in clause 3A, two, must be subjected to the aff affirmative resolution of parliament. It must be subjected to the affirmative resolution of parliament because of the consequences involved. And the type of pepper spray should also be clearly categorized for the respective uses intended by members of the public and law enforcement officers. And um, I listened uh, very closely to uh, Senator Welch, and I must say that I really also question the approach to the crafting of this legislation by incorporating the use of pepper spray, particularly with the primary objective of putting it in the hands of our vulnerable women to merge it into firearm legislation. I agree with the Senator in that regard, and rather whether the approach should have been to put it into a separate piece of legislation, make it less restrictive and less onerous for the vulnerable women of our country to be able to 
possess and use pepper spray. Mr. Vice President, one other aspect that um, I will just briefly mention without going into much details is the question of possible human rights violations by the use of pepper spray by police to break up demonstrations, political rallies, worker rallies, and public gatherings, and other gatherings of those sort. I would have really liked to see inputs from stakeholders engage in human rights organizations regarding this human rights aspects of the use of pepper spray. But as, a, as far as I'm aware, this consultation was not done. As a Vice President, with the remaining time I have, I'd just like to probably uh, look at one or two specific clauses within the bill. Um, clause nine, that deals with offenses relating to the sale or transfer of pepper spray. And again, in the context of what I've said and the context of making this, this um, ownership and use of pepper spray so prohibitive, the, the, the extent of, of fines that um, as proposed here in Clause 9, $550,000, in terms of seal or transfer of pepper spray, um, conviction on indictment of $750,000. These are indeed disproportionate. I agree with Senator Welch in this regard. And again, you know, seeing, seeing this type of, um, this, this, the, the, the extent of the fines here um, in the context of um, encouraging, you know, our vulnerable women to to, to acquire and, and use pepper spray, it is indeed a, a, a deterrent, in, in my opinion. Mr. Vice President, Clause 11, Section B, um, in, the, in the last part of, um, of that Section B, where it says that such a permit shall not be granted to a person whom the commission of police or police officer authorized by him as the case may be, has reason to believe or to be of intemperate habits or unsound mind. We really need to tighten up there, in my opinion, because this is just a, a question of uh, an assessment in, in terms of just reason to believe and whether or not we should go the route of having a prescribed assessment by a, 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 a medical practitioner come into play here in terms of, of this requirement. So Vice President, um, Clause 22, Section B, Roman 3, 2. I've said it again, but I'll repeat in terms of um, the regulations being subject to the affirmative resolution of parliament and not the negative resolution of parliament. And there's added on there in two, may prescribe a fine of $250,000 and imprisonment for two years. And I would just like some clarification on that in terms of in what context is this fine of $250,000 and imprisonment of two years. Is it for a, a breach of the regulations, and if so, what particular breach of the regulations? I, I, I have a difficulty in terms of um, linking that fine to the, to the regulations. Again, clause 26, in terms of custody of pepper spray and, um, and the, the, the extent of the fines, um, $100,000 being too harsh for, for someone who finds pepper spray and does not report it within seven days. Um, the time, again, is questionable. It's, it's, it could possibly be extended. It's too short in my view. So, Vice President, I go to Clause 17A. Section 3, 
on page 13, where it says that a person issued with a pepper spray permit to purchase, acquire, or have in his possession pepper spray is authorized to purchase and have in his possession one canister of pepper spray. And this 17A section 3 really deals only with lost or stolen or expired pepper spray. And I ask the question, what if somebody has that one pepper spray and it is used up? Does that person have to go back and get a new permit to get another kind of pepper spray? Or if that person shows that it was used up in that self-defense scenario, whether or not the same permit could be used for that person to procure another can of pepper spray. And um, finally, with regards to clause 30 on page 16, the transitional provision, um, Honorable Attorney General, I really question the need for this transitional provision because this transitional provision really is saying that um, a person who has possession of pepper spray prior to the coming into force of this act, within six months, we are giving six months for a transitional provision for that person to apply for a pepper spray permit. So the person has, having that pepper spray prior to this bill being enacted and proclaimed has it illegally. And why are we going to such extents for such a long period of time to allow for this transitional provision? Why provide this transitional provision? And Section 3 of this clause 30 even goes on to say the minister by order may extend the period for application of a permit for position of pepper spray under subsection 1. Why should we need to extend it beyond six months, being a transitional pro provision? Or should we not have this transitional provision at all? What is the reasoning behind it? I thank you, Mr. Vice President, for this opportunity. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to bring conclusion to this debate. I wish to thank all honorable members for their submissions, considerations, and for sharing their philosophical underpinnings on the important issue of protection of the vulnerable. I start off by saying this is not a bill for women. This is a bill for the vulnerable because there is an equal risk and circumstance to men. Of course, the preponderance of evidence is that our women are at risk. Now, if I were to make my response down to basic philosophical issues at first and then to issues in relation to the clauses permit me to say as follows most of our most important vulnerable heartfelt issues in society are the subject of great debate and never-ending production in terms of solution why do I say that? It took us 35 years to deal with child marriage. It took us 22 years to amend the Domestic Violence Act. It took us nearly 50 years to amend the Supreme Court of Judicature Act to create divisions of court, to create a specialist environment for children, for families, for women. We've been on the floor of the parliament, certainly Senator Vera and I, in the 10th Republican Parliament, where we were dealing with the children's laws, the Children's Act, 
We came to the floor at four o'clock in the morning of that debate. And quite properly on a matter of principle, the independent bench abstained from voting on the law. I say properly because they felt then that two issues needed to be addressed. One, the issue of child marriage. And two, the issue of discrimination against sexual orientation. And without those two issues being dealt with, the independent bench took a principled decision and said they will not support the Children's Act, full stop. It was up to the government and the opposition. And I don't say that pejoratively. I'm saying how strong principles can be at times that stop us from making decisions. Look at the debate on child marriage. Back and forth and opposition saying no. Bringing someone here to say that if a girl is old enough to have a menstrual cycle, that she should be married. They yes? They said that. Had to strip the special majority off and risk it on the Constitution in saying that this was proportionate in a society such as Trinidad and Tobago. Came in for loads of criticism from the editors, the newspapers, talking heads. But... As Senator Welch put it quite properly, we're here to make laws. The first principle, section 53 of the Constitution, for the peace, order, and good governance of our society. Principally, everyone agrees that the dangerous version of pepper spray must be regulated. That's a given. We've heard that. Senator Timal has, in his contribution, said... Let's liberalize pepper spray, but then went into a very detailed analysis of how the police must be regulated for the use of pepper spray. They must be trained. They must be cautioned. Obviously, the question that jumps up is, well, what about those who have the legalized pepper spray? If you're going to regulate the Trinidad and Tobago police, the law enforcement authorities, according to Senator Timal's submission, standing alongside the submission that you should liberalize pepper spray and therefore sell it freely. How do those two policies mix? No law for pepper spray that is legalized, no restriction, no permit, no scrubbing, but regulate the police on excessive use. I'm not quite sure how those two marry. Is this a sword or shield? Is another strong philosophical underpinning. I accept that the arguments are quite properly, it may be a sword, it may be a shield. From my perspective, in coming to the parliament, not making laws for myself, I have my own individual views, but I'm a member of a cabinet, and I stand by the cabinet policy, which is in this bill, Otherwise, I'd be outside the cabinet because you always have the liberty to leave the cabinet if you choose. We are considering it as both sword and shield. In the sword and shield construct, we say, because there is no data in Trinidad and Tobago, that we ought to start with permission to have pepper spray. And we say you ought to have permission because... The evidence in other jurisdictions show us, Denmark in particular, the United Kingdom, in Canada, that when you have pepper spray in wide circulation, that it becomes a risk factor such that in Denmark, they had to recall it, and in Canada, they had to recall it. In the permitting position, we are quite simply having an intellectual issue that is very real. I thank Senator Vera, I thank Senator Timol, I thank Senator Welch for pointing out that there may be a dissuasion in people having to suffer from the bureaucracy. It's one of the underpinnings for the fulminations that we've had on the liberalization point. That bureaucracy is the antithesis of protection in this instance. And I accept that that's a very commendable and worthy submission from honorable senators. I wish to put onto the record 
the reason why we propose a six-month period for transition is because that we know pepper spray is in circulation. The reason that we've allowed for the extension of time is because we're in a COVID pandemic and therefore the operationalization may require extensions of time. It's in the law. So if I said six months in the law and I needed three months extra because the police station is closed because we're under a state of emergency for that aspect of business, then I don't want to have to move an act of parliament to come and extend the three months. So I put the ability to extend for the six months. But let's deal with bureaucracy. We do not intend to operationalize this law by a line which is through the door where you're filling out a form where the officer didn't attend, where you have a psychometric analysis, because Senator Diaz Singh had proposed that we go for a psychometric analysis of every person applying for pepper spray. What we propose is that we will use the digitization platform exactly as we've done in the Registrar General's office, in the licensing office, where you will apply online in 24 hours of a state of emergency, 350,000 people applied for curfew passes. Was that a problem? We propose in the digitized platform to eliminate the bureaucracy. You apply online. You fill out the customer information field. You submit your application form. In the Registrar General's office, I can tell you, as we move to the digitization of company filings, we're going to invite people to register online. And when you're registering online, you're going to upload a picture of yourself holding your driver's permit and the driver's permit and your passport. And when you come in on one occasion only to perfect the registration, all the information is there. So all that it is is a customer verification information point. And in this permitting of pepper spray, we propose online application designed by iGov, information, I am, I live at, I wish to acquire, I am not a person described as a prohibited person, I am not a person with a charge for raping someone, for kidnapping someone, etc. I am not the subject of a domestic violence protection order or undertaking. I'm a convicted person, I'm not a convicted person. You fill that out, you send it online, you print your QCR repeat, um, um, form, you arrive at the station, you scan it, your information pops up. You verify, you take your prescription and you go. I want to talk about culture for a moment. In the carnival atmosphere of Trinidad and Tobago, it is now standard that you buy your carnival tickets online. You fill out the form online. A QCR pass is issued immediately. When you get to the carnival set, they scan it, your band is on, and you're in. So they actually know everybody who's in the carnival party in Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm giving an example of where the bureaucracy can be eliminated, where our culture organizes itself. And it's true, honorable members have made the submission. Why would a criminal want to use pepper spray when he has a gun or a cutlass or a knife? But the point is, the data in other jurisdictions show us that when you have pepper spray in wide circulation, it becomes a problem. Senator Vera raised a very interesting point. Let us have the less lethal version under a certain number of grams or micrograms or ounces of the particular ingredient that is pepper spray. And those that are weaponized version or military grade, as the Honorable Senator put it, let's regulate that instead. So stop for a moment. Let's look at what the bill says. 
The bill says, let's use the concept of the weaponized version. The bill says that a noxious substance is a prohibited weapon within the definition of the Firearms Act. So even if we liberalized pepper spray, you'd have to disapply that liberalized version from the Firearms Act. You would have to take it in every single place where the Firearms Act is and treat with it. We've done that. That is what this bill does. This bill looks at a prohibited weapon in every clause that exists in the current law that prohibits it. So even if we were to say, listen, everything under X amount is free, you still have to come with this bill. Because you have to amend this law. Senator Lutch Media said, let's come up with a standalone piece of law. Let's think about that. A standalone piece of law will still require us to do this bill. Because we have to consequentially amend every single clause inside the Firearms Act. Because a firearm includes a prohibited weapon. A prohibited weapon is a noxious substance. We agree that the military-grade pepper spray ought to be treated differently. Let's assume that we agree that. It's going to have to be by an order which says what the amount is. I don't respectfully view the definition to be amateurish, Senator Vera. It was unusual to hear you say something like that, if I just put it plainly. Because the definition of pepper spray is tagged on to the order of the minister which prescribes the chemical, volumetric, and other substances by law. In this circumstance, therefore, even if we were to look at legalizing a lesser amount of potency using a standalone piece of law, we are in agreement that we must amend the, pepper arms, pep, the Firearms Act. Have to. Can't not treat with it because right now it criminalizes that. But to accept that we will use the liberalized over the counter version, as Senator Timol has suggested, as Senator Welch has suggested, as Senator Vera has suggested. Yes? How do we know, with a million canisters of pepper spray in circulation, tell the Trinidad and, Poli Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, know which one is lethal or which one is not? How do we operationalize that? My own is the safe one. My own is not. My label inside that I put on is a correct label because I bought it because it's free. Comes from China. Senator Vera is one of the leading experts in intellectual property law in this country and we are so lucky to have him. Passing off, parallel importation, other forms of supply, equally applicable here. Pepper spray made in one country that doesn't comply with standard of another country. How do we police that? Do we go back to the days where you stop everybody with pepper spray like two joints and say it's a plant-like substance and you send it for analysis and you're pending and you caution the person? How do we do that? What we see, the philosophy underpinning this bill, apply online, don't lie. Submit it, attend, collect your prescription, nothing to do with firearms, no form of bureaucracy of the kind of firearms, no psychometric analysis, no details, no come to visit your home, see where you're applying it, no consent from your wife, no consent from a doctor, none of that. Fill out a form and go to your police station, fill it out online, present yourself on the police station's door, pick up your prescription, under penalty of law, if you have lied or told an untruth, and go to the dispensary to keep it. And the record then matches up. At least this way, law enforcement knows who has it, where it is, the manufacturer has records, 
And I agree with Senator Welch. And I agree with Senator Vera. When we have some data under our belt, we get to say, let's start changing the law. Because the intention is not to have a static version of the law. Honorable members, I'm sure you will all agree that you have never seen an attorney general of a government come and amend laws repeatedly the way we do. Repeatedly. Administration of justice preliminary inquiries, number one, number two, number three. FATF compliance, number one, number two, number three, number four. We come over and over and over and over again. Every time we get suggestions. I give undertakings on the floor. I fulfill my, uh, my, my undertakings. And now, honorable senators, I am not being pejorative to anyone's point of view. I'm trying to explain the philosophical underpinnings and the intention on operat operationalization. And I fully respect and support honorable senators' points of view. Because obviously, until I say these things, we could very well be within that trap of bureaucracy, of excessive law enforcement utilization. I take Senator Timur's point wholly as a very proper and established point. I understand that. I hear Senator Welch. So I'm explaining now why it is your concerns can be measured with and what the intention in, you're going you're gonna to smile when you hear this, typical al rawi line just start i really believe in just starting and moving as we go along honorable senators it may surprise you to know that at the registrar general's office we have eliminated seeing 15,000 people every three days they don't come in again because we are digital on our platform on our land registration and on our company's registration, we're going to eliminate all of that foot traffic as well. By registration online, filing online, structures online. Honorable senators who are practitioners in the courts, Senator Lutchmedial, Senator Vera, Senator Welch, we go to court at home. You go to Tobago, San Fernando, Port of Spain, and Rio Claro from your desk. Prisoners don't even move again. When we were passing that law in this Senate, I was criticized up and down by the opposition bench as to why that would never work. A lot of people objected. Lawyers objected. They, they took the Chief Justice's practice directions under challenge. And today, they are the advocates of how well that system works. Not that it's going to replace in-person trials, obviously, but it's here to stay. It's efficient. We are looking at the issue of virtual attendances for the parliament. It's an active discussion. We do certain hybrid approaches that way. But my point is that the society is moving. As it relates to the prohibitions in the legislation, there are a lot of commendable thoughts. We can look at two, I think, of the issues of the penalties are important. Why did we take the penalties the way we did? Because the overall structure of the penalties were adjusted in the Firearms Act. And, and we kept this in line with those provisions. Senator Timal, as it relates to the issue of self-defense, self-defense does sometimes include the, aggressing, the, the aggressor. The apprehension of the fear of violence is a, a legitimate circumstance to be factored. So self-defense does not mean that you disqualify someone from acting in anticipation of protecting themselves. The case law treats with that. We put the self-defense position because we must contemplate the offenses against the person's act. And we're saying that pepper spray ought to be used in self-defense. And we're putting that as an aid to interpretation by the courts when they apply the circumstances of each case to the factors of their, of their positions. I'm not troubled about that particular issue because it's been well traversed in our courts and I think the courts can get it right. As it relates to those fines that I was speaking about, 
There's a general philosophy in legislative understanding that you have to keep within the architecture of the legislation. Breach of copyright, Senator Vera will back me up, has by far higher penalties for unlawfully copying of a book if it's not for academic purposes. On our intellectual property side and our financial crime side, we drop in million dollar, five million dollar structures. And I just remind that the, the, the breach of regulations fine, for instance. We amended the Interpretation Act last year to raise those fines. Because before that, the breach of a regulation was only $500 if you hadn't provided for it in law. So this is not far off of where the Interpretation Act limit is already. But in those submissions, we're dealing with the architecture of the Firearms Act. I don't think when you respectfully look at what the options were available, a standalone piece of law, if we did it, would always involve the amendments to the Firearms Act, the Offenses Against the Persons Act, the Children's Act. That's why I started in my contribution on the last day in referring to the other laws that articulate with this. If we look to the understanding of transition as raised by Senator Mark, where Senator Mark asked for, if I understood it correctly, for the commercial possession, for the people who are in commercial possession, or possession of uh, pepper spray in commercial quantities to be treated differently, we respectfully disagree with that. We do not seek for people who have imported pepper spray illegally to be treated in any different way from the persons who are in possession, let them apply, let them surrender their stock, let them go through the process of having it lawfully done so that the consistency of the product is determined. Because otherwise you may have weapons grade, military grade, alongside a can of bagon. And we need to be careful about standards as we approach these issues. With respect to the seven-day period for the turning in of the... Um, product, if you are no longer a qualified person, we propose to amend that to say that you have reasonable cause. For instance, you were in jail and you couldn't do it within seven days. Some of those circumstances can be factored. When we look to um, the issue of affirmative resolution, the current law in relation to firearms regulations, firearms regulations, since the Beginning of the Firearms Act is by negative resolution. I respectfully believe that insofar as we regulate firearms by negative resolution, that we ought to keep the regulation of pepper spray by negative resolution because it would just be an opposite consideration to say, well, we've dealt with firearms all along by negative resolution. But pepper spray, part of which the philosophy involves liberalization, we're going to treat that to a higher standard of affirmative resolution. It just doesn't sit well within the architecture of the Firearms Act. Attorney General, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I'd like to say that as we stand in a COVID pandemic under a state of emergency, the government would very much like to finish this work so that we can press on with delivering this relief to persons. We are in a situation where each of us are required to lend a hand to law enforcement, to give people a fighting chance, to empower our vulnerable people for at least an opportunity to protect themselves. I know there's one other martial artist in this forum, and that's Senator Vera. Perhaps there are others that have spent their lives in martial arts, as both of us have. Training is an essential requirement. Awareness, spatial understanding of understanding when you can be perceived to be a victim. All of these are very essential positions. The caution in relation to pepper spray is that it may very well be used against you. It gives a false sense of comfort, but at the same point in time, it gives you a fighting chance. And therefore, we support the deploying of pepper spray into the society. We respectfully believe that once we have some data under tow, that we can start to treat with this in a different way, as we did for decriminalization. 
the risk factor that we have, how do we know the thing from the thing? It was very easy in marijuana because you had a quantity, not the thing. We had a quantity inside that black canister with a trigger. We don't know what's inside. And when I look to the forensic load and the analysis load, we don't have the capacity to differentiate in that way. And that in and of itself is open to abuse. Because you could stop someone and say, I don't believe that that is what it is. Let's go down to the station and let's check it out. Right now, you can do that under the Firearms Act. Right now, every pepper spray canister in your possession is a breach of the law. So we are attending to that. Madam President, I look forward to contributions at committee stage as we look to mitigate the risks around us by spending less time in the parliament as we can so that we can deliver services and conditions to our constituents, those of us that are members of parliament or those of us that are involved in active work as we deliver relief to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this matter and I beg to move. Honourable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601, be now read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601. Attorney General. Madam President, in accordance with Standing Order 661, I beg to move that the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered clause by clause. Those in favor say aye. aye. <laughs> Those against say no. no. Honorable Senators, you will remember that I said when the division is called, we will allow three minutes for everyone to return to the chamber.
Honorable Senators, the three minutes, the three minute period has elapsed. We will begin the division. You remember that the question is that the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered close by close. Mr. Ambrat? Yes. Mrs. Gopi Yes. Mr. Senaran? Yes. Mr. Hussein? Yes. Ms. West? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. DeFritas? Yes. Ms. Cox? Mr. Singh? Yes. Mrs. Sagram Singh Sukla? Yes. Mr. Bakas? Yes. Mrs. Aldarma Lee Singh? Yes. Ms. Bethelme? Yes. Ms. Ali? Yes. Mr. Mark? No. Ms. John? No. Ms. Lashmirial? No. Mr. Naked? No. Mr. Vera? No. Ms. Dionarem? No. Mr. Timal? Yes. Mr. Welch? No. Senators voting for, seven senators voted against, table no exception. Honorable Senators, the result of the division is as follows. 15 senators voted yes, seven senators voted no, no one abstained. The Senate shall now go in co to committee of the whole to consider the bill close by close. Attorney General, you ready? <clears throat> Honorable Senators, we are about to begin the uh, deliberations of the committee. I remind members that there are 31 clauses to the bill and there are circulated two sets of amendments, one set proposed by Senator Lachmidial and the other by the Attorney General. Clauses one to three. The question is that clauses one to three stand part of the bill. 
The question is, the clause is one to three, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses one to three, now stand part of the bill. Clause four. The question is that clause four stands part of the bill. The question is that clause four now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause four now stands part of the bill. <clears throat> Clauses five and six. The question is that clauses five and six stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, on the section, on, on the clause six rather, um, subsection D <clears throat> of clause six, yes. I would like the Attorney General to clarify whether there is no clash between the functions under this legislation of the Commissioner of Police and that of the Minister, particularly when you look at um, section um, clause 6A, B, C, which would have to be approved by the Commissioner of Police. And then the D is saying that any other person approved by the Minister, or is this clause saying um, Madam Chair, drew you to the Attorney General that the Minister of National Security will be responsible for approving pepper spray to these categories in A, B, and C, respectively. I'm, I'm trying to get some clarification. As I'm wondering if there's a, a, a clash between what the Commissioner of Police is supposed to be doing and what a minister is supposed to be doing in this section. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the minister is the minister defined as the Minister of National Security in the Act itself. The Commissioner of Police is a person that does licensing under the Act. Section 6 of the Act, which is being amended by Clause 6 of the Bill, simply says that the minister may by order affect the category of persons in Section 2E. There is therefore no conflict at all in terms of the operation. The intention in the new subsection 2A is to broaden the circumstances of officers defined in Section 2, Section 6.2, so that estate police, SRPs, municipal, or any other person by order may have that intention in D is in the, in the event that the immigration officers come into the need for alternative um, use of uh, f force, that they would have this as an alternative use to carrying firearms, etc., in the event that those become eventualities. I say that specifically because the concept of border control is something that is under review and who is present at your ports of control, and that is why 2AD has been included in the manner it has. Um, Chair, again, is the Attorney General saying only officers such as customs and excise officers um, would be captured under this D, or would it include other persons? I, I want to make sure, Madam Chair, that this section seems to be very wide as it is broad, saying any other person. So I'm trying to determine what does this mean? Does it mean only immigration and customs and excise officers, or would it capture any other person? That is the area we need to clarify. Madam Chairman, the law proposed in the bill is the following words any other person. I just gave an example to bring it to life. So it is any other person. Well, Madam Chair, I, I, I think that this is too broad in the context of what we are trying to achieve here. And I don't think a politician should be involved in this 
kind of approval process. This can lead to nepotism, discrimination, and whatever that minister, and whoever that minister wants to approve can be approved here. So there needs to be some checks and balances to rein in this particular minister in terms of his ability to simply approve any other person, Madam, Pres Madam Chair. So I would like the Attorney General, if he could probably consider an amendment to confine the minister to those persons who fall within immigration, which would be under his purview, and allow the commissioner of police to be responsible for approving other persons. Attorney General. Duly noted, Madam President, there are regulations intended to be issued in accordance with this, and the regulations will provide for the narrowing of circumstances. Finally, may I ask if this order, and I'm proposing, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I know that you always want things in writing. We did put in writing, but I think that because we want to maintain some checks and balances and accountability, any order to be approved by the minister should be subject to an affirmative resolution of the both houses of parliament so we would be able to have an oversight of who are these people the minister is approving. And I would like to propose an amendment to this section as it relates to order after order, Madam President, well, if you could... Well, just one second. Formulate what you are proposing as the amendment. Uh, Senator Vera wants to make an intervention, so you have a few, a little bit of time. Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable AG, uh, at section six, um, where it reads, I, I understand the amendment to, to now we'll say firearm, ammunition, or pepper spray. So at section six, where it says, holds a firearm user's license, whether we might just take out the word firearm, so to read only if he holds a user's license with respect to such firearm, ammunition, or pepper spray. Madam Chair, the, the reason why we didn't add that into the concept of pepper spray into section six itself is that we still want to go through the licensing permissions for firearms, which are different. They include the provisional license, the strictures, etc. So specifically, anything to treat with the pepper spray aspect we've treated uh, as the permitting aspect that we've created. But we did not want to interfere in 6.1 with the provision subject to Section 7, a person may purchase, acquire, or have in his possession a firearm or ammunition only if he holds an FUL, because it is Section 7 of the Firearms Act that goes on to speak to the exemptions um, that apply pursuant to law, and then we get into the whole concept of the um, provisional licensing and regime for firearms and ammunition. So we wanted to treat with pepper spray under the regime of just the permit. Madam President, may I um, respond to the submissions made by Senator Mark? Before Madam Chair. Um, just, just Honorable second. Attorney General. Yeah, sure. Uh, before you do it, Ma Madam Chair, uh, I would just like the Honorable Attorney General to be consistent. And there is in the Firearms Act on the Section 2 a concept or a definition of competent authority. Competent authority. And it means the Commissioner of Police, the Comptroller of Customs and Excise, the Chief Immigration Officer, or the Chief of Defense Staff. I would like, Madam President, rather than go with the affirmative resolution, let us, any other person approved by the competent authority. In this instance, it will, we, we, we know that these people are competent and they can take that decision that we are talking about rather than introducing a politician into this particular arena. So I think we should be consistent with the legislation that we are currently amending. It talks about competent authority. Attorney General. Madam Chair, competent authority is not used anywhere in the law other than the place where it is used in the circumstance that it is used. 
the issuance of pepper spray and pepper spray only to persons permitted by way of order means that once permitted, the operation of the law runs alongside that. The Commission of Police has the power to recall the regulation set out circumstances. And in those circumstances, Madam President, I wish to respectfully disagree with Senator Mark's submission as not being required in this instance. I want to respectfully disagree with so, the Honorable Senator Attorney Mark, General. Yes. Do you have a proposed amendment? Um, as a substitute for so, the affirmative um, order, I would like No, we're to dealing with clause 6 sub D. Yes, yeah, so I'm deleting minister by order. I don't want the minister to be involved in this. It is corruption, nepotism, and discrimination. Yeah. Oh, Mark, no. that, that, that can lead to that. I'm not saying that the minister in the position now is Sen going Senator to do that. Mark, so that you are seeking to delete the words minister by order. Yes, and, I'm, uh, uh, and after it was approved by, I'm just including the competent authority. So that would be consistent with the law. So, Senator Mark, I believe the amendment you're seeking is at clause 6 sub D to delete the words minister by order and substitute the words competent authority. Is that correct? Honorable Senators, the question is that clause 6 be amended as follows at 6 D to delete the words minister by order and substitute the words competent authority. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. So we will allow the three minutes and we will begin the, the count at 12.55.
Mr. Rambara? No. Mrs. Gopiskun? No. Mr. Senanan? No. Mr. Hussein? No. Ms. West? No. Dr. Brown? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. DeFritas? Ms. Cox? No. Mr. Singh? No. Mr. Sagram, Sen Sukla? No. Mr. Bacchus? No. Mrs. Azama Lee Singh? No. Ms. Beth Elmi? No. Ms. Ali? No. Mr. Mark? Yes. Ms. John? Yes. Ms. Lachmidio? Yes. Mr. Nakin? Yes. Mr. Vera? No. Ms. Dunarin? No. Mr. Timal? No. Mrs. Thompson, are you? No. Mr. Welch? No. Madam President, the result of the division is as follows. Four senators voting yes. 20 senators voted no. There were no abstentions. Honorable Senators, the result of the division on the proposed amendment is as follows. Four senators voted yes, 20 senators voted no, and no one abstained. So the amendment has therefore not been accepted. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 6 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 5 and 6 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 5 and 6 now stand part of the bill. Clause 7. The question is that Clause 7 stand part of the bill. There is an amendment circulated by Senator Lachmidial. Senator Lachmidial. the um, issue of importation and manufacturing distribution and strength and volumetric contents and so on be dealt with in regulations as opposed to an order and subject at least to, if uh, not a Sorry, at second least. Senator Lachmidial, speak a little um, louder. I'm hardly hearing. I think the wrong mic was on. Sorry. That, um, that the, um, asking the Attorney General to consider whether or not the things that are dealt with in the proposed section 6A1 that it be dealt with via regulations and not an order, and that it be subject at least a negative, if not affirmative, resolution. I, 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 I take your point on all the other regulations being um, negative, so at least consider whether or not, instead of an order, it would be subject to a negative resolution, um, regulation subject to negative resolution. May I, Madam, General? Madam Chair, I, I think that it may be quite useful to at least put the negative resolution for the order so that it gives somebody the opportunity to negative um, the order in the event that there was concern as to the um, contents and volumetrics. I'd just like to say the reason that we selected order in this fashion is that every other instrument is usually done that way. Um, and I mean everyone from toxology to uh, blood analysis to all of these things. Um, but insofar as it's... Um, fairly sensitive issue, perhaps we could do that. So, Madam Chair, 
I don't know where that fits in with that which is circulated in proposed section 61, 6A1, delete the word order, replace with regulations. So it would be, the government would be prepared to say delete the word, well, after the word, the word order, order. In suit. In suit. Subject to the negative resolution of yeah, government. Yeah, may by order, subject to negative resolution. If that's agreeable. Senator Lajmedia. Yes, please, ma'am. That's agreeable. So, will you withdraw your. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I withdraw and. Um, and what you can do is now propose the, the new amendment. Yes. Um, so, I will, I'll put it to the, sure. to the floor. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7 be amended as proposed by Senator Lachmidial by inserting the words subject to negative resolution after the word order. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that clause seven, the question is that clause seven as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause seven as amended now stands part of the bill. Clause eight. Question is that clause eight stand part of the bill? Manager, yes. I would like through you to ask the Attorney General what was the rationale for the, the, re the removal of the president and in this context the cabinet and its replacement by a minister? Uh, because I would have thought that the cabinet would have had greater accountability and oversight over the minister. So I'm just trying to get clarification from the Attorney General as to the thinking um, of the cabinet for the leading itself and putting the minister in its place. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Senator Mark for the inquiry. Um, this springs from Section 8A of the Constitution. The president in this instance here is equivalent to the cabinet because it's not the president with words of qualification as to seeking consent or advice or um, recommendations of any other person. In the parliamentary structures that operate and in the cabinet structures, a minister is not permitted to do something on his or her own when it comes to legislation. It's always underwritten by policy approved by the cabinet. So in every instance where a minister acts, a note must be taken to cabinet for that minister to act. So there is cabinet approval for the minister to act. That's not spelt out in legislation, however. Okay. Honourable, Honourable Senators, the question is that clause eight now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause nine. The question is that clause nine stand part of the bill. The question is that clause 9 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 9 now stands part of the bill. Clause 10. The question is that clause 10 stand part of the bill. Senator Lachmidial, there are amendments proposed by you and circulated. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you, Madam Chair, Attorney General, uh, this deals with the concern that I raise, and I think the Law Association also raised it as well, with respect to a person being charged, being automatically um, deprived of the right to acquire pepper spray, or even having to surrender and becoming a prohibited person and having to surrender their pepper spray. Uh, just by way of reference, one of the offenses in the schedule is um, trespass, criminal trespass. I don't know that being charged should automatically deprive someone and in similar fashion to which you have left it to the judicial officer to be able to determine whether someone um, in certain domestic violence situations should surrender the pepper spray. I was wondering if you would consider an amendment that would give the judicial officer the power to make an order that someone be prohibited and also or, or surrender their pepper spray and the permits in the event that they are charged. 
May I, Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, I, I thank Senator Lachmedial for this, in, this submission. And if I could just explain the policy behind the government's approach on this. Madam Chair, it is true that you are innocent until proven guilty and that a charge is merely a charge. In the data that we have, on the raw side of data, as it relates to violence against vulnerable people, and I use that term specifically to mean more than violence against women, there are two categories that we have noticed are in existence. Number one is the category of violence against women, and number two, against elderly people in the vulnerable um, circumstance. That's why we have included trespass, criminal trespass, because we amended the Trespass Act to include home invasion, because there were significant circumstances of people throwing elderly people out, gang-related activity of throwing elderly people out, and therefore we wanted specifically to capture the concept of trespass. Secondly, in relation to violence against women, our society is currently reeling with the fact that people have clean certificates of character, but 15 charges for rape, 12 charges for rape, even two charges for rape. And we must, in our policy considerations, we thought that until the backlog and the rapidity of the system improves, backlog disposition and rapidity of justice in the system improves, we wanted specifically in the context of pepper spray to disapply people who were on charges, but we didn't say any charge. We went for a schedule of charges. And we took two schedules. We took the Bail Act schedule, and we took the schedule to the Firearms Act. So when we look to the schedule, as we have proposed it to be amended, Madam Chair, that is at clause 27, beginning at page 10 of the bill, we are seeing charges for offenses against the person. Shooting, wounding, grievous bodily harm, inflicting injury with or without a weapon, attempting to choke, commit an indictable offense, using drugs, administering poison, an offense of burglary, offense under the Kidnapping Act, offense against the Trafficking in Persons Act, offenses against the Children's Act, and offenses against the Trespass Act, being specifically forcible entry and forcible detainer. So we didn't take any um, charge per se. We took a certain category of charges which we considered to be egregious enough to disapply the person from obtaining pepper spray. So it was in those circumstances that we've sought to ask Parliament to approve the ability to deny a person on a charge for these serious matters from being in possession of pepper spray. Madam Chair, may I? Yes. Um, thank you, Attorney General. I understand the policy. However, what you're asking for is not the ability, but an automatic denial. It's yeah. almost similar to the automatic denial of bail. Mm -hmm. For example, when someone is charged under the Domestic Violence Act, you often have cross charges. Mm -hmm. So uh, a husband and wife or cohabitants may make, bring, and two persons could be charged at the same time, mm -hmm. arising out of the same incident. One may ultimately be found to be the aggressor, while the other one may be found to be the victim. Mm -hmm. But in your present configuration, there's an automatic denial to the victim as well. So it, it is not only, um, you know, can give rise to, there are so many permutations and scenarios that can arise. The judicial officer sees of the facts of every matter may be best placed to determine whether or not a person should be deprived or not, whether um, the circumstances warrant it. Uh, if a person armed themselves with pepper spray in the past and present themselves to the court now and they are accused, cross-accused with another cohabitant or spouse of an act of domestic violence, the magistrate who they appear before may be better placed to determine whether or not that person should be automatically deprived of their pepper spray or not. May I, Madam Chair? I thank the Honorable Senator. The Honorable Senator made reference to the Domestic Violence Act, and that's very true which is why we have not put the Domestic Violence Act into this similar category. We specifically allow the judicial officer in domestic violence circumstances to consider the circumstance of undertakings or cross-undertakings in the domestic violence context, where they can say, listen, I still wish to have the pepper spray and have the judge think with that. The problem with the judicial discretion where we are in the situation of looking to have a mass supply of pepper spray available is that it is going to be extremely cumbersome 
for somebody to return to the court for the issue of the grant of pepper spray. So we'd be asking people who are on charges and who are awaiting trial, who may not be coming up on remand positions in regular cycles, to literally bring themselves before the court and have the court consider the circumstance of the grant of pepper spray. That, for us, is too bureaucra bureaucratic a role. Further, and I say this with no um, ill intent or negative reflection upon the judiciary, something as powerful as asking the judiciary to use electronic monitoring bracelets in domestic violence circumstances. It was only through urging that we got the first order the other day or to consider the issue of bail. So we're very mindful of avoiding the bureaucracy of having the court consider any and every situation where somebody's on a charge, knowing that people who are on charges for these specified version of offenses, sexual offenses, kidnapping offenses, trafficking against uh, persons offenses, those are the ones that we seek to disapply. Well, AG, I want to thank you, Chair. Um, whether we should be consistent in 21B then, because um, you can be prohibited from getting a firearm license for five years when you have a conviction um, of a domestic violence offense, but maybe we should put for charges and broaden it as well for firearms? So, sorry, would you just explain that? Consistency for? 21B. Section 21B. Yeah, where a person is convicted of a, of a domestic violence offense, he may be refused to be granted. Um, would you want to put it for charge there, when we reach down there, so that there's a consistency? I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to be certain that you're referring to section of the act or clause oh, of the no, bill? Of the act. Of the act. So, so section 21B2. Two. Where a person is convicted of a domestic violence offense, the commissioner may refuse to grant that person an FUL or FUEC for a period of five years from the date of conviction. So, and the submission is? So I'm saying that you can have a gun even though you have a charge. Shouldn't it be consistent if we're going with this clause? So this is something that has come under, may I? This is something that has come under a significant amount of analysis. Whilst the law says this, and you may be granted in this provision, it is the very clause 22 that a number of senators have referred to, where, sorry, it's not 22. It is, it is where we look at the intemperate. I'm just looking for the section itself of the act where the commissioner of police has a discretion to call in a license to manage or to revoke where, where, where they are guilty of intemperate or in his, circum, in his view are in circumstances of demonstrating intemperate behavior, etc., that he may call back the license. That's where the firearm debate happened in terms of the callback of firearm. Because the pepper spray is intended to be in very wide circulation, of, unlike the circumstances of firearms, which are in very limited circulation and much stricter uh, measurements for, for concern, we didn't want to conflate those two positions. The policy underwriting, which Senator Lutchmidial has asked us to consider, is don't go with charge, take charge that the court tell you if you can. But the issues of the bureaucracy of getting back to the court to ask for permission is going to be an administrative nightmare in our respectful view. So we are just disapplying those positions immediately for a category of offenses, not for all offenses of charge, but for serious offenses, kidnapping, children, rape, etc. Thank you. I'm not quite sure that I... Just press it. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm not quite sure that um, I agree with the bureaucracy. Once a person is charged and they come before the courts on the, at their first appearance and bail is set and so on, the police or whoever automatically have to make an inquiry as to whether the person is the holder of an FUL. That is a significant um, in any of these types of, of offenses. So in similar fashion, if there's a register that deals with pepper spray, as you've envisioned here, they can similarly make the submission at that first hearing that this person is also the holder of whether... Of a so, sorry to interrupt. I'm not talking about first hearing. Right. If it was just that, it would be easy. Mm -hmm. We have 26,000 matters in arrears right now 
on the indictable side, we have 104,000 cases a year, motor vehicle, we have, forget those, we have 26,000 per year, and we have about 60 or odd thousand cases in arrears. What about those people who are on charges who are not before the court in remanded conditions, where they come up in a cycle where the court will hear them regularly, but who have dates adjourned to next year or whenever it comes? They would have to bring themselves before the court if they wanted to apply for pepper spray and say, well, hold on, I have a charge, but I'm not before the court right now. My, my matter is next year. It's the, it's the people in arrears that is the administrative difficulty, okay. not the people that are prospective. Well, it would still... It would still... Um, at some point in time, they would be coming before the court so they could make their application as they could make any other application to vary the conditions of their bail and so on. They can make an application if it is that they are so... Um, now, the, what you are saying there is that this section would disbar persons who have already been charged. It's meant to work retroactively as well? Yes, because the, the, prospect, the prospectivity of applying for the pepper spray is no. And if you have a charge for rape, for forcible detainer, mm -hmm. for trafficking in children, you you're, you're going to be disapplied. If you are charged, but yes. not convicted. Yes, yes. We don't want those people as a matter of policy at this point in time, until we have data and understanding, to be in possession of pepper spray. But this also means that first, okay, so would you then consider removing the charge or convicted under domestic violence act and leave everything there? What you have right now, it's only undertakings and um, interim orders. But would you at least consider all persons, just because there are situations where you have two parties in our scenario, both being charged, and I'm saying one could be the victim. So would you at least consider then making all domestic violence matters subject to judicial discretion and leave the Schedule 2 and Part 2 of the Bail Act as the automatic? So, Madam Chair, we're looking at Clause 10, 16B, a person who is charged or convicted with the matters in the second schedule, charged or convicted with serious offenses, I will just put it that way, in the Bail Act, charged or convicted with an offense under the Domestic Violence Act, is prohibited for the purposes of one, a person who is the subject of an undertake. So we dealt with an offense under DV in part subsection one. Sure. Subsection two takes a, a finer point on domestic violence. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of one, a person who is the subject of an undertaking which is enforceable, as we all know, mm -hmm. an interim order or protection order in proceedings under the DV shall be prohibited unless a court determines otherwise. So we have very carefully looked at the domestic violence circumstance. Part subsection 1 says charge conviction, charge conviction, schedule of the act, schedule of the bail act, right. offense, charge or conviction for offense under the domestic violence act, out, but with DV, being alive to the fact of cross undertakings and the fact that you can be guilty of an offense for breach of an undertaking, we have sought to allow the court to consider that in the domestic violence context. Sure, but at the first instance when an, an incident occurs, you can have both parties charged and before the courts. It may not be that it will result in a, it, it may not the charges can actually arise from the incident for both parties or more than one party. It may not necessarily... Madam Chair, I'm sorry undertaking. to interrupt. We, did, we, we looked yeah. at the DV Act very, very carefully. The charge under the Domestic Violence Act is a very different thing from the undertaking Correct. under the Act. Agreed. Right? So the charge is actually done in very rare circumstances. Mm -hmm. Most people go to the Domestic Violence Court for a protection order. The issue of a charge hasn't even come up yet. So charges in rare circumstances, conviction may happen, but it's not to be confused with getting before the court for a protection order where you're not in a charge situation at all. Right. So we're saying if you're on a charge, because the police thought it necessary to charge you for domestic violence, that's very different from the person coming to seek a protection order of his own volition or her own volition. But in the rare circumstances that the charge does arise, you, you agree that you can have... And we have think if it's charged, it's domestic yeah. violence. We have too many stories of people being killed in domestic violence. Mm -hmm. We want to protect the vulnerable. Okay. Um, in which case, Madam Chair, then the other, 
amendments well would not be necessary to renumber and so on. Okay, so is it that you are just proceeding on your the first part of your amendment, which is to delete the word charged? Well, well, yes, Ms. Mantra, I would like to put it to consideration. Yes, but yes. you want to re to take the rest off? Well, no. Oh, well, you just hold on until the re yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So, so uh, unless we uh, well, the proposed amendment to well, what I was calling the new subsection five, uh, we can deal with that, and then we can put the whole thing to the question, please. Sure. Yes. I, I think so that, this yeah. is part of section 16B as well, um, Attorney General, which deals with the fine. Um, so I would like to propose, if you are a prohibited person, as in convicted, or in this case, as you are proposing charged, proposing charged, um, I think that the penalty should be higher than if you merely have simple possession. And I think all the penalties were across the board at um, $250,000 and imprisonment for five years on summary conviction. I'm proposing that we raise the summary conviction to $500,000 and imprisonment for five years. If, if it is that the, the mischief that we're trying to achieve with this bill is to really prevent persons who ought not to have pepper spray from having it, um, then a person who knows and well, ought to know that they are a prohibited person, go, uh, that they go ahead and acquire it, I think they should have a... Um, a higher penalty than someone who is not prohibited but has it without a license. Madam Chair, may I ask a question, please, for, for, for clarification? I thank the Honorable Senator for the submission. Um, I'm looking at clause, uh, at this clause, 16B, subsection 3, as opposed to a new 5. It's on page 5 of the bill. Yeah. We propose a person who is prohibited from obtaining a pepper spray import permit a pepper spray permit under subsections 1 or 2 is and is found with pepper spray in his possession, commits an offense, and is liable. The submission coming at us is that we should raise the summary offense to 500. But I'd like to explain the philosophy behind what is proposed in subsection 3. We have sought to go for a hybrid offense, a summary and an indictable. And at the summary, we've elected to go with $250,000. The option for the higher position is always available on the indictable route, which is the $750,000. So we didn't want to necessarily raise the summary bar because we want the officer to treat this in the circumstance of what is serious and what is not serious, if I could use those terms loosely, between the summary jurisdiction and the indictable jurisdiction. In those circumstances, when we read the fact that this is a hybrid structure where you can elect to charge under a summary route and elect to charge under the indictable route, we didn't want to be seen to be excessively criminal or disproportionate on the summary side to go as high as $500,000, for example. So that's why we offered the summary offense at 250 with the option, if it's more serious or egregious in the mind of the charging officer, to go along the indictable route. So, uh, honorable senators, I'm going to put to the vote the first part of the amendment as proposed by Senator Lachmidial, which is the amendment to uh, clause 16, Clause 10, 16, B, 1, A, B, and C, okay? So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 10 be amended at 16, B, 1, A, B, and C, as circulated by Senator Lachmidial. Those in favor, say aye. Those against, say no. No, respectfully. So we'll begin the division at 127.
-hmm. Mr. Rambarat? No. Ms. Gopiskun? No. Mr. Sinanan? No. Mr. Hussein? Ms. West? Dr. Brown? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. DeFreitas? Eh, eh. No. Miss Cox? No. Mr. Singh? No. Mrs. Sakram Singh Suklau? No. Mr. Bacchus? No. Mrs. Lazama Lee Singh? Miss Batalmi? No. Mr. Ali? No. Mr. Mark? Yes. Ms. John? Yes. Ms. Lachmidia? Yes. Mr. Nakin? Yes. Mr. Vera? No. Dr. Dial Singh? No. Ms. Deonarine? Mr. Tima? Yes. Mrs. Thompson Ahi? No. Could you repeat that, Senator? No. Mr. Welsh? No. Honorable Senators, the result of the division is as follows. Five senators voted in favor of the amendment. Twenty senators voted against it, and no one abstained. That particular amendment has therefore not been accepted. Senator Lachmidial, in light of that, what is your position with the rest? The insertion of a new section B4, um, as well. This is no longer relevant. This was premised on the previous one. And I would just ask for the 16B3, as it, as it currently is, to be put. Madam President, the question on the fines. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 10 be amended at 16B3 as circulated by Senator Lachmidial. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the news have it. Anything else, Senator Lachmidial, at six, so the rest is withdrawn? So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 10 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 10 now stands part of the bill. Clause 11. The question is that Clause 11 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 11 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those ag Can I hear some more ayes apart from the Attorney General because we need members of the Senate to be voting? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 11 now stands part of the bill. Clause 12. The question is that Clause 12 stand part of the bill? Senator Lachmidian. Attorney General, the proposal here uh, was just that we insert in addition to any other penalty which may be imposed because if you commit an offence with the use of pepper spray, you also could be committing another offence known to law. For example, an offence under the Offences Against the Person Act. Um, what I thought and what I presume to be the policy here is that um, if a person commits a criminal offense but it's, you are adding to it now, you want to add a penalty for utilizing the pepper spray to, to add an additional punishment for using pepper spray in the commission of an offense. So I just wanted it to be clear that this is not um, being charged under this piece of legislation doesn't prevent the person from being charged for the simple, for the 
whatever the act is, whether it's assault or whatever it is. So I was just proposing the insertion of the words in addition to any other penalty which may be imposed on any, any other law. I'm not sure if that's the tidiest wording, but that's the gist of it. Attorney General. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Lachmidial, for volunteering the caution as to implied repeal or effect of law, which is, to put it in its, its simplest version. Madam Chair, I wish to give the assurance that there is no implied repeal as a result of this law. In the creation of offenses right across the board, we don't say notwithstanding any other law for the application of the law because it's read as that way. The implication of law would only apply, the implied repeal of law would only reply where there is a close connection between the matters. Um, I'll give you an example. We created the Trespass Act amendments. We did the Anti-Terrorism Act amendments. And none of these say notwithstanding other laws. You may be charged under all other laws, whether they are written laws or, in fact, that they are common law offenses that are known to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. But I thank the Honorable Senator for the caution. Honorable Senator, the question is that Clause 12 be amended as circulated uh, by Senator Lachmidial. Those in favor say aye. Those again say no. No. I think the no's have it. The amendment is not accepted. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 12 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 12 now stands part of the bill. Clauses 13 to 20. Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 13 to 20 now stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 13 to 20 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 13 to 20 now stand part of the bill. Clauses 21 to 29. The question is that clauses 21 to 29 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, under clause 22, because of the nature of this particular matter that is before us, I would like to suggest for the Honorable Attorney General's consideration that under 22 subsection 2, which reads regulations made under subsection 1, shall be subject to negative resolution. I would like to respectfully suggest that we um, delete negative and replace it with the word affirmative so we can have greater oversight and accountability as it relates to the provisions contained in Clause 22 of this piece of legislation. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, the government's policy is that we go for negative resolution. The reason being that the matters that we are proposing for consideration here, the regulations are going to speak to possession, storage, transfer, prescription of records, etc., manufacture, production, importation, diversion, sale, etc. Madam Chair, we believe that administratively it is by far more successful for us to look at the negative resolution route because at the affirmative resolution route it becomes extremely difficult to amend affirmative resolution. Having the idea of affirmative resolution is great, but the practicalities of affirmative resolution become extremely complicated when amendments have to be factored. We find it easier when a motion to negative resolutions uh, or regulations are produced that there's greater flexibility to cause the amendment to the thing that you want. So it is a practical consideration, not that Parliament does not have oversight, but that instead we do. Madam Chair, I'd just like to say this as well. In the past, when we were very paper-related, we had, I recall in my short few years in the Parliament, that we used to have that table filled with books, and we used to get everything that was being laid in Parliament delivered in packages overnight, etc. We are now in a situation where we have a number of standing committees. 
where we have electronic access to positions and where we are actively notified as parliamentarians of the laying of material. So we are in a much better place for the negativing of um, reg regulations, orders, etc. So in those circumstances, I take the caution that Senator Mark is offering, which is that Parliament ought to have oversight, and I assure that the negative resolution oversight is an adequate memory uh, option, forgive me, particularly if we want to cause an amendment to the thing that we're looking at. Okay, Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable AG, clause 26. No, uh, well, let's just deal with this um, issue first, which is clause 22 that was raised by Senator Mark. Senator Mark, you have disagreed, and we move on. In my position. Yes. All right. Um, so you could put it to the... To the uh, you you yes. wish for it to be... Yes. That we, we, we delete negative, replace it, or substitute the word affirmative, and we can put it. Clause 21. The question is that Clause 21 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 21 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. Yes. I think the ayes have it. Clause 21 now stands part of the bill. Clause 22. The question is that Clause 22 stand part of the bill. And the question is that Clause 22 be amended as proposed by Senator Mark at... 22, three. Three, two, by deleting the word negative and substituting the word affirmative. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think the no's have it. The question is that clause 22 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 22 now stands part of the bill. Clauses 23 to 25. The question is, the clauses 23 to 25 stand part of the bill? The question is, the clauses 23 to 25 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 23 to 25 now stand part of the bill. Clause 26. The question is, the clause 26 stand part of the bill? Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable Attorney General, I'm wondering, in terms of the coming into possession, the seven days, I am aware of someone who died recently, and they were looking to find important documents. Still can't find them. He's been buried. Seven days is too short, so I'm suggesting either we extend the time, or in the, that three, subsection three, where you talk about the offense, um, contravenes, but put in some sort of without reasonable explanation or cause. Either of those options. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. We had intended on proposing that. We unfortunately did not circulate it. The CPC's department also discussed it. It was something raised by the Law uh, Association and several uh, honorable senators. And Madam Chair, we do accept um, the proposal to amend sub, subsection 3 as proposed in subsection, as in clause 26, to put in the caveat of lawful excuse. So a person who contravenes subsection, we can do it there, a person who without lawful excuse. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, without lawful excuse. Without lawful excuse. So, Madam Chair, we're proposing an amendment to clause 26, subsection 3, after the word who, insert the words without lawful excuse. The question is that clause 26 be amended as follows by including the words without lawful excuse after the word who at 26. So, sorry, three. Madam Chair, forgive me. I wanted to keep within the architecture of the law. I noticed that the prosecution offense in five uses these words in the absence of lawful excuse. So just to keep with the consistency of the act itself, I'm so sorry to ask you to change those words, but may I suggest we say a person who, in the absence of lawful excuse. Sure. 
Honourable Senators, the question is that Clause 26 be amended as follows at 26.3 after the words after the word who to insert the words in the absence of lawful excuse. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 26 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 26 as amended now stands part of the bill. Clauses 27 to 29. The question is that clauses 27 to 29 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 27 to 29 now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Se On page 11, what that? persons prohibited from obtaining a pepper spray should be permit. I don't think it's parrot is meant there. Uh, what page, Senator Thom? Page 11. Just on the schedule, too, the big heading in bold capital letters. 11, we, we're on page 15. You, you talk about clause 27. We're on clause 27. Could you just tell us where you are seeing the... At the top of the page, Schedule 2, you have persons in, in yes. capital letters. Yes. Persons prohibited. From obtaining a pepper spray parrot is written there instead of permit. Well, mine has permit. Yes, Madam Chair. The proofed, the proofed yes. version has permit. Oh, um, I have, I don't know. Yes, so, so what, what happens, if I may, in the electronic environment that we're operating in, the proofed version of the bill which is circulated on the table is not in, in circulation, but what is proofed um, has permit, but in any event, on the proofing of law, that um, anomaly would have been picked up and corrected by the um, publishers. If it doesn't happen, a corrigendum can also be issued by the government printery as well. No expense. Thank you. It's done electronically now, Senator. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 27 to 29 mm -hmm. now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 27 to 29 now stand part of the bill. Clause 30. The question is that clause 30 stand part of the bill. Senator Lachmidial. Madam Chair. Senator Mark. Chair, I would like to um, indicate that there is need for us to ensure that this Honorable Senate is not abused by any external forces who may have objectives that we may not be conscious of. Madam Chair, I frowned upon persons who have deliberately, maliciously, and illegally imported hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of illegal pepper spray into this country and I'm, I am asserting that this transitional provision has been put here deliberately to give cover to those individuals who may have imported huge quantities of pepper spray. And now that this law is before us, the government, through the Attorney General, is seeking to impose this particular provision that would give these people a pass. Madam Chair, we need to be very clear. If you imported guns illegally in this country, you must be a price. And we must not, as a parliament, make illegal or legalize what is at this time illegal. And therefore, 
we are proposing an amendment to this particular section that says that in subsection one, subsection one rather, shall not apply to persons who hold in excess of five devices containing pepper spray. Now the Honorable Attorney General has said we have to be even handed. You cannot give five a bligh and a hundred thousand, no bligh. So then we can say no bligh to no one. And those pepper spray should be seized, taken charge of by the state, and they will decide what they will do. I think it is wrong, Madam Chair, for this parliament to give cover to illegal activities by anyone, and then we are giving coverage to these people by agreeing to these transitional provisions. So, Attorney Madam Chair, I, I, that yes. is my submission Attorney General. on this matter. I welcome the painting of conspiracy theories. That would be like saying, we passed the law, we put in a clause to say that all people guilty of serious indictable offenses should have it automatically discharged after 10 years, and then we proclaim it secretly at night before anybody knows. This country is not unaccustomed to conspiracy theories. Well, you have but a I big finance here, I understand. Senator Mark, you were allowed to make Senator Mark you were allowed to make your submission, and, in, in, and everyone else was, was silent. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, those conspiracy theories notwithstanding, if I could explain the intention and the wording of Section 30, Clause 30. Clause 30 is the transitional provision. As a government, we've taken careful note, and I recall vividly an article where the issue of pepper spray was being canvassed in society, and I recall these words in an article where the reporter had gone to Charlotte Street and other parts of Trinidad and reported that there was no more pepper spray available for sale because people had sold out. And it hit me as to how wide the circulation of pepper spray has been in this country as a large elephant walking around on our streets, not even in the room, right? In those circumstances, being conscious of the fact that many people have pepper spray in their possession, from a personal point of view, we went immediately to the position of saying, a person who has pepper spray prior to coming into force of this act shall within six months of the commencement of the act apply to the commissioner of police or police officer authorized by him as the case may be for a pepper spray permit. The pepper spray permit is a pepper spray permit to be considered by the Commission of Police. So we didn't want to go into the smart manism of four or five or three, because we know in this country that people will divide it up into fives, into fours, into threes. The concept in law is actually called smoothing. It's in the financial area of concern. Senator Lachmedia knows this well with her experience in the FIU, etc., where people just take the large quantities that they have and they distribute it among smaller people, usually innocent-looking people, older people, etc., and they smurf it away because these are innocent people coming before you. So the philosophy behind Section Clause 30 is that a person must apply. If you have it in your possession, the Commission of Police will consider those circumstances what we want to do is to make sure the thing is known for what it is, its volumetric and chemical content, and that a permit is provided. We anticipate, Senator Timal had very um, commendably asked why six months. We had anticipated that the operationalization takes a while, hence the provision for six months. And because of the COVID pandemic and wanting to get this thing done as quickly as we can, we've allowed for the extension of time so that you don't have to move an act of parliament to cause that to happen. So that's the rationale for it. It, uh, it can meet the mischief um, that Senator Mark has painted, albeit in the less contentious way. I firmly maintain that 
as lawmakers, we ought not to be given a ply to any importer of huge commercial quantities of pepper spray with the passage of this piece of legislation by giving them a free pass, Madam Chair. So I maintain this is wrong and we should not be used in that way. So that is our position on this matter. Senator Dana Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a point of clarification. Attorney General, can you confirm that within the six-month provision, is importation of pepper spray allowed without a permit? So to, to answer that question, it will not be allowed. You cannot import without a permit. If people brought in pepper spray before, who knows how that happened? It certainly didn't come in under an import permit. It was hidden in a container. It was brought in in a suitcase. There were multiple circumstances where these things happened because you could not bring pepper spray in because it was a noxious substance, a prohibited weapon. But the fact is, it's here. So nobody will be permitted in, under the transitional provisions to bring the pepper spray in. You would have to await for the approved circumstances and to be an approved person to come in. What we're taking conscious reflection of is that the societal information is that people have it in their possession and that people sold it. We know that for sure, so we must treat with the issue. And just for the record, Madam Chair, this does not in any way feed any of the conspiracy theories offered by Senator Mark. There is no facilitation offered to people. In fact, the law is very clear. You must bring it in. No exceptions to the rule. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 30 be amended as circulated by Senator Lachmi Dial. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think the no's have it, the amendment. Yes. Mr. Rambarat? Yes. Just for um, clarification, I'm not waiting for the three minutes because I think since the last vote, everyone seems to be in place. Mr. Rambra? No. Ms. Kopiskun? No. Mr. Sinanan? No. Mr. Hussein? Ms. West? No. Dr. Brown? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Ms. Cox? No. Mr. DeFritas? No. Mr. Singh? Mrs. Sagram Singh Sukla? No. Mr. Bacchus? No. Mrs. Lazama Lee Singh? No. Ms. Bethelmi? No. Imam Ali? No. Mr. Mark? Yes. Ms. John? Yes. Ms. Lachmidia? Yes. Mr. Nakid? Yes. Mr. Farrow? No. Dr. Dayal Singh? No. Ms. Dayanarine? Yes. Mr. Tima? Yes. Mrs. Thompson Nahi? Yes. Mr. Welch? No. Honorable Senators, the result of the division is as follows. Seven members voted for the amendment, 18 members voted against it, and no one abstained. The amendment, therefore, was not accepted. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 30 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 30 now stands part of the bill.
Clause 31. The question is, the Clause 31 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could I just give notice that I'd ask you to consider revisiting Clause 7, just to add a few words in, but after we do Clause 31, uh, we just needed to add in any negative resolution the issue of, of Parliament. Um, so, Madam Chair, in respect of Clause 31, the Law Association had commented that um, we ought to broaden this to include the concept of um, or other weapon in the consequential amendments that we do. So, Madam Chair, Clause 31, which proposes consequential amendments to the Offences Against the Persons Act, the Dangerous Drugs Act, the Domestic Violence Act, the Miscellaneous Provisions Law Enforcement of Officers Act, had originally provided um, only the inclusion of pepper spray. What we're asking for is that we, instead of saying firearm or pepper spray, we broaden it to say firearm or other weapon or pepper spray to meet with the concerns offered by the Law Association. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 31 be amended as circulated by the Attorney General. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that Clause 31 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 31 as amended now stands part of the bill. Clause 7, we visit it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Madam Chair, in keeping with the amendments suggested and accepted by the government, we had proposed the insertion of the words subject to negative resolution, but we didn't say of Parliament. So if I could humbly request that we include those words of Parliament, the insertion being after the word order, mm -hmm. insert the following, subject to negative resolution of Parliament. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 7 be amended as follows. At 6A, after the word order, insert the words subject to negative resolution of Parliament. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause... No, go ahead, ma'am. You right. Honourable Senators, the question is that Clause 7, as amended, now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 7, as amended, now stands part of the bill. Madam Chair, may I crave your indulgence, like my honourable colleague, the Attorney General, by asking you to revisit Clause 30 and to ask the Attorney General if he would have any objection in um, in terms of principle um, and continuity, he would want to make uh, adjustment to clause 30 subsection 3, subjecting that order to a negative resolution. Well, before I put anything about revisiting the clause, we'll discuss it informally. Attorney General. Madam Chair, the extension of order, the, the extension of time by way of order is a very simple matter, and we have not subjected that to negative resolution in any of the COVID situation circumstances, and I would not like to deviate from that general policy. Okay, so Senator Mark, we won't bother to, yeah, yeah, okay? Yes. Honourable Senators, the question is that the bill, as amended, be now reported to the Senate. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill, as amended, will now be reported to the Senate. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam President, I wish to report that the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021 
was considered in committee of the whole and approved with amendments. I now beg to move that the Senate agree with the committee's report. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Senate agree with the committee's report on the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Attorney General. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601, be now read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601, be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Rambara? Yes. Ms. Gopi Schoon? Yes. Mr. Sinanan? Yes. Mr. Hussein? Yes. Ms. West? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Cox? Yes. Mr. DeFritos? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Mrs. Sagram Singh Sukla? Yes. Mr. Bacchus? Yes. Mrs. Lizama Lee Singh? Yes. Ms. Bethelmi? Yes. Imam Ali? Yes. Mr. Mark? Yes. We supported him, man. You know what? Ms. John? Yes. Ms. Lachmidia? Yes. Mr. Nakin? Yes. Mr. Vera? Abstain. Dr. Dayal Singh? Yes. Ms. Deonarine? Yes. Mr. Timo? Abstain. Mrs. Thompson Nahi? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Madam President, the result of the division is 22 senators voted in favor, no one voted against, and two persons abstained. Honorable Senators, the result of the division is as follows. 22 Senators voted yes, no one voted against, and two Senators abstained. The bill has therefore been passed. A, a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601. Leader of Government Business. To now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to a date to be fixed.